go. I just have to click done. Going live. We're live. Phew. Fantastic. Sorry, guys. I'm a, I'm a novice because Paul, who always does this totally reliably, couldn't manage because of Mother's Day. So he delegated it to me. And I've done okay. it. I've I done think it. You're live. Yeah, we, we are live. Yeah. Okay, Alison, it's all yours. We are, and I'm going to record. Alan, are you recording? I will start recording now. Yeah, so uh, it's all yours now, Alison. We are ready. Okay, excellent. Well, uh, first of all, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Very happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers that may be joining us today and to the mothers of those that are joining us today. I am, phoning, I am participating here today from the unceded and stolen territories of the Coast Salish people, the Tsleil-Waututh, the Musqueam, um, and also am uh, speaking here today uh, from the Fire This Time movement for social justice. My name is Alison Bodine. I am a social justice activist, an author, and a researcher in Vancouver, Canada and chair of Vancouver's anti-war coalition, Mobilization Against War and Occupation, as well as on the editorial board of the Fire This Time newspaper. I really welcome you to today's very interesting panel. Uh, it is the second in a series of what will be three panels discussing uh, the Freedom Convoy here in Canada. Today, the panel is called Canada's Freedom Convoy, Structure and Working is organized by the International Manifesto Group and the Society for Socialist Studies with co-sponsors and media sponsors by the Fire This Time Movement for Social Justice, the Canada Files, and Canadian Dimension. Today's panel is showcasing the work of key journalists and critical forces, delving into the details of the Freedom Convoy, its structures, dynamics, its implications for Canada's evolving political climate, and continues to be an important uh, discussion uh, here today. Today we have with us Cam Scott, Gabriel Haythorn-Thwaite, Jesus Rodriguez Espinosa, and Benjamin Norton. Barbara Perry and Emily Leadham, unfortunately have both set regrets due to other urgent work and family matters. Uh, but we hope to hear from them as part of further discussions and have appreciated their work contributing to this important discussion so far. The Freedom Convoy arrived on Parliament Hill in Ottawa on January 28th and remained until February 23rd, 2022. Eventually on February 14th, the Trudeau Liberal government invoked the Emergencies Act for the first time since it replaced the War Measures Act in 1988. During the Freedom Convoy, there were reports of racist attacks, harassment and assaults against healthcare workers and people wearing masks. Businesses in Ottawa were forced to close due to traffic and noise disruptions. The protests blockaded the Ambassador Bridge, stopping trade between the US and Canada and costing about $3 billion in trade losses. During the Freedom Convoy was often called or reported as a trucker convoy, but in the end, there was much debate about the social and political composition and real questions about the role of truckers at all. Among the anti-Trudeau and anti-liberal signs, there were Confederate flags, swastikas, QAnon symbols, and a debate began about whether this protest was a protest of the disaffected working class, the ultra-right, the alt-right, mix of all of this. And the actions of the Freedom Convoy, of course, did hearken towards the January 6, 2021 mobs that attacked Capitol Hill in the United States following the election loss of Donald Trump in November of 2020. This mob, similar to the Freedom Convoy in Canada, some referred to as right wing or ultra right or fascist, sparked a similar debate in the United States to what is happening in Canada in response to the Freedom Convoy. Now, the Freedom Convoy was initially focused on anti-COVID-19 vaccine mandates, and the January 6th mob was sparked by the inauguration of US President Biden, but the debate is very much the same. Primarily, what is the social and political composition of the convoy, and why is this important to uh, organizers, activists, and academics uh, in Canada or the United States? 
There are other important questions that have been raised that we will continue to discuss today. What was the response of the police and why did it appear so different from police response to indigenous led protests or actions for social justice or workers on the picket line? Why did it take so long for the federal government to respond? And what is the significance of the question of individual freedoms versus societal freedoms? No matter what side of the discussion or we are on, we can be certain that as this capitalist imperialist crisis deepens, there will be many more events as such as January 26th at six in the US or the Freedom Convoy in Canada. The growing crisis of capitalist class leadership has left a vacuum that created the Freedom Convoy. And we must expect that people on the right and the left are going to take initiatives in this vacuum. And that's why we have this panel here today and why this series of panels is so important. I think is a sign of a healthy political atmosphere, a sign of increasing polarization in society. And it's important to discuss and debate the Freedom Convoy because it's important not only to bourgeois politics, middle class politics, but also working class politics. The Freedom Convoy exposed and took advantage of deep differences in the ruling class in Canada, and we can only expect these differences to grow as the crisis deepens. So I really thank everybody for joining here today on a sunny afternoon here in, in BC. I don't know what the weather is like other places and also on Mother's Day uh, to continue this discussion and hear from a great panel of speakers. We're going to start with our panel and then I ask if people could please, um, you know, save uh, your questions until uh, we are ready, uh, but you're welcome to post in the chat. The chat is open to everybody. Um, but we want the panelists to be able to speak without interruptions, of course. So please keep your microphones on mute. And uh, you probably have already noticed, but you can turn on your video. Just be aware you are on video and everyone can see you. Uh, but uh, definitely uh, great to have you all here today for this important discussion. Without further ado, I'll go ahead and introduce our first speaker, Cam Scott. Cam Scott is a poet, a writer, and an organizer from Winnipeg, Canada, Treaty 1 territory. His books include Romans, Snowmare, and The Vanishing Signs, forthcoming from ARP Books. Cam, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you so much. Um, hello from Treaty 1. Uh, happy Mother's Day, again, for all the mothers out there. Uh, a great day to reaffirm our commitment to defend and expand reproductive freedom. <laughs> in the face of uh, right-wing maneuvers, um, some of which we'll speak about today. Um, I think that this is uh, an exciting event to take part in because ideally an extended theory of uh, some of these phenomena um, that intersect the, the Freedom Convoy, I think should grasp the relationships between imperialist war, domestic inflation, renaissance family values and pro-natalist lobbies, um, the targeting of, of, of queer and trans youth, uh, as well, of course, as the identity politics of, of the Freedom Convoy. Uh, so without simplifying these causal relationships, we should observe the larger crises in which these developments are enmeshed. That's a lot more than I'm going to do today. But uh, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that the increasingly isolated fraction of the left that defends the convoy against all evidence also regards some of these only apparently isolated social causes as, as frivolous with respect to the shape and vocation of, of, of the working class. You know, Some of these commentators, I think they're a little objectifying. They're attracted to the smell of gasoline, this kind of masculine musk of the trucker as a, as a blue collar exemplar. But I think this credulity of the convoy's figuration misses the fact that it was a fairly carefully managed production from the start by a variety of far right and racialist interests. So before noting the petty bourgeois class character of the participants and their backers, I think we should say that the convoy studiously avoided all topics of concern, even for the trucking industry, wage theft, workplace safety. Uh, some may recall an investigative report from a few years ago that revealed that newcomers to Canada were paying thirty-five dollars to $55,000 to carriers like GLT to get hired. Immigration consultants were conspiring with 
firms hiring through the temporary foreign worker program, um, marginal operators who comprise uh, a significant current of the Freedom Convoy as it tenuously relates to truckers, were being granted more permits for foreign labor than there were trucks in their fleets because the cash racket and labor trafficking was so lucrative. So this is the reality of the trucking industry in Canada, where one fifth of the workforce, I believe, is South Asian. So if we really wanted to talk about the trucking industry as specifically concerns the maintenance of border regimes by the federal government, that would be a fantastic place to start. Um, but instead, a great deal of attention stalled upon this picturesque Canadian trucker, you know, as a strange kind of visual average of the white working class in a political play cast by the Tories and those further right. Um, from the start, the convoy convoked a cultural and not an economic populism, uh, to my thinking, though populist rhetoric by design um, kind of denies this distinction. And, and the culture of the convoy was very narrow. On the face of it, and for all the bizarre right-wing antipathies represented in the procession, you know, the convoy wanted to speak about mandates, as said. Uh, so briefly, I want, I, I want to look at the class position and politics of, of the anti-mandate movement uh, to understand why perhaps it became an incubator or a touchstone for a proto-fascist uh, agglomeration uh, throughout Canada, and not just Western Canada. Um, firstly, you know, I think one can imagine a respectable version of this cause. I didn't like the mandates as they existed for a variety of reasons. Uh, I spoke to an unhoused person who was vaccinated early on and couldn't prove it to access nominally public space. I think that the mandates were very obviously intended to force people back to badly waged work as the state cut off emergency benefits and ended eviction moratoriums. But you know, the, the convoy never cared about these things either. If we look at the position of the, the small firms and the owner operators comprising the convoy and the small capitals who were its largest donors, this information is in plain sight. We don't see anything like a broad class-based movement. You know, we see a, it's a pretty clear picture of a middle-class small business lobby. Uh, last year, Stats Canada reported that more than a fifth of small businesses couldn't bear any more debt. Uh, small businesses account for more than 98% of uh, all Canadian employer businesses, two thirds of the total labor force, uh, which they're under. So you know who really suffers here as the margins on small business are squeezed are the millions of waged and precarious workers whose surplus value is the actual substance of those margins. Um, so support for the convoy came almost entirely from the small business interest. It came from bosses. The trucking industry, I think like any sector of a neoliberal economy is also structured around creditor-debtor relations that obscure class distinctions in a crisis. But what we have in the anti-mandate movements at their most coherent uh, is pretty straightforwardly a petty bourgeois revolt against monopoly capital during an unprecedented transfer of wealth upwards, in which again, the working class uh, stands to lose everything. Uh, and at worst, the petty bourgeoisie uh, stands to lose that which distinguishes them from the working class. Uh, so I think this is where the specifically racial character of the Freedom Convoy comes into play in this moment too. Because of course, we're not theorizing class in a cultural vacuum. And the experience of class is, is, is densely mediated in a colonial state where access to a wage is starkly tiered and clearly uh, racial and bourgeois property relations reproduce a colonial dispossession. We're not ever going to confront the economic anxiety of a downwardly mobile uh, property owner as such, right? Nor can we easily barter um, leftist reason for right-wing scapegoats, you know? So the sort of right-wing 
nativism that we see in the convoy, which is even gallingly parodic of some extremely salutary scenes of uh, recent indigenous resurgence, you know, has long been the program of the far right, uh, including its political bloc and the conservative party, as well as the peoples and maverick parties who directly convoked this, this movement. Um, so I think that this convoy is better understood as a pop-up street level manifestation of a much larger political project that, that doesn't lack for political representation, however much it seethes against the present government. You know, the other day at the conservative party debates, you could watch Pierre uh, Poiliev boast about his support for the convoy after being provoked by Leslin Lewis. So the sequel to the convoy is, is, is sure to play out in the streets as elsewhere. You know, you see these schisms within, within the conservative party that uh, follow its wake. So as time passes and we continue to have these conversations, I think it becomes increasingly clear that this issue in this industry were simply vehicles for right-wing opportunists who've been strategizing something like this for a while. Uh, the mandates are gone. And yet we read that cities across the country are bracing themselves for Canada Day demonstrations for freedom. You know, that's really one of the most sinister words in politics. Um, from its early memorandum of understanding with an eye to the eager participation of, of military and security forces, Joint Task Force Two participated in you know, a coup in Haiti, war crimes in Afghanistan. It was really clear that this was a self-styled coup, an unwitting quotation of Canada's misadventures abroad. Uh, last week's Rolling Thunder motorcycle convoy was organized by Veterans for Freedom. And if you look at the steering committee of this group, you'll meet Captain Tom Marazzo of the Freedom Convoy, uh, Daryl Smith, Edward Cornell, Andrew McGillery, these are, these are Freedom Convoy alumni, and they're simply trying it again, but swapping out the trucks for different noisy vehicles um, with a tenuous relation to uh, any industry. So it's quite telling. I think what's left of the anti-mandate convoy from earlier this year is a sea of Canadian flags. And it's more in Kuwait on the face of it, but I think also somehow clarified because we can readily see now that this is a right-wing nationalist movement that intends to make Canada great again. So in this regard, I think of the convoy as the street ready portion of a large proto-fascist movement that's transpiring on many fronts at once. Um, to quickly conclude where I began, you know, it'd be interesting to look at the proximity of um, Tory convoy apologists to the Campaign Life Coalition. I'll bet you could draw a pretty tight circle of a Venn diagram there. It's in the nature of um, culture war, you know, that it is fought in this only superficially uh, discreet way in all kinds of settings uh, throughout our everyday lives and our streets and our communities. And uh, I think that that's what alarmed people the most about the convoy. And that's what, uh, what we should be most mindful of moving forward. Uh, I'll, I'll stop and I'll let someone else speak, but I'm looking forward to the Q&A. This was a great opportunity, thanks. Thank you very much, Cam Scott. Um, it's definitely uh, sparked a few questions already. So uh, it's an important discussion, as we've said, and one that is not over. And um, the political and class character of, of the Freedom Convoy is manifesting again, like you said, Canada Day, this uh, motorcycle caravan and other parts of Canada as well. Um, our next uh, speaker is Gabriel Haythorn-Thwaite. He's a former labor allied school board trustee here in BC and currently works with First Nations in education, governments and policy. He is a PhD candidate in the facility, Faculty of Education at Western University in London, Ontario researching the political relationship between First Nations and the BC public education system. Gabriel, you're up. Uh, thank you, Alison. And thank you to the organizers and sponsors of this forum. Uh, I think that 
the bulk of those of the large majority who are against uh, what I call the business freedom convoy have tended just to dismiss its significance. Um, and it's important that we have this forum that really does grasp uh, that this is really a new phase uh, and a very dangerous uh, far right phase in Canadian politics. What I want to share today are my thoughts on uh, the character outcomes and implications of uh, the business freedom convoy. And in terms of its character, overall, what I would um, say, given that English Canada has long followed uh, broadly in the train of right wing American trends, given that the Trump presidency was a four year dress rehearsal uh, in fascism in the United States, I think we can see the business freedom convoy as both the start of a fascist movement in Canada, as well as a dress rehearsal for an American sponsored fascist takeover of the country. I mean, it's not a coincidence that they went to the Capitol and they successfully took it over for a number of weeks with the apparent collusion of the local police. <laughs> that, those are all danger signals uh, that we cannot ignore. Um, in terms of its character, I think the regressive uh, nature of the movement is very clear. Uh, Cam uh, spoke to this in the previous forum, uh, definitely laid this out. Uh, we can see it in how they've responded to COVID itself, of which the hysterical contempt for what are really mild public health measures is clear, like uh, conflating masks with genocide. That's a pretty big tell. Um, I think it's even more demonstrated in uh, the refusal of the movement to oppose the, the worst of COVID uh, government policy, which in my opinion are the, the record handouts uh, to the corporate rich, uh, of which the most prominent example uh, would be the more than $100 billion uh, feeding frenzy and payroll subsidies that has come through the Canadian uh, so-called emergency wage subsidy, which has been running for two years and continues at the expense of the working class taxpayer. Uh, the convoy doesn't give a damn about that. So it's very clear where they stand. Uh, we can also see the regressive character of the movement in the roots of their leadership in regressive mobilizations and initiatives. And just as an example, the most prominent spokesperson, Tamara Litch, uh, was one of the key organizers of the much smaller 2019 United We Roll convoy, which mixed pipeline worship with migrant scapegoating. Uh, she also was uh, a, a member of the governing council of the Wexit Maverick Party, uh, a reactionary party that contested uh, the 2021 uh, federal election. And other leaders have People's Party uh, of Canada links, a party that did much better than the Maverick Party uh, in 2021, uh, one that doubled, more than doubled the Green Party vote. Uh, also, other leaders have connection to neo-Nazi agitation and violence. I think another um, aspect we should zero in on are the political demands of the convoy in terms of how they wanted to implement their program. And this is another big signal of, of, uh, a, of a deeply regressive character. Um, Canada Unity was the front organization for the convoy, and they brought to what I've called a memorandum of misunderstanding to the government, essentially calling on the colonial governor general and the unelected Senate to uh, uh, come together with convoy leaders to form a ruling uh, junta council, uh, essentially. It was a, uh, a recipe for an autocratic takeover. Um, and, you know, let's consider the fact that the unelected Senate is easily the most corrupt and worthless political institution in the country. I think that tells us a lot about uh, the political character of the convoy. Now, in terms of the outcomes, um, what I see overall are that while progressive liberal opponents are generally dismissive of the convoy's impact, and in fact, they scored really what was an open net goal, politically speaking, that uh, at a key point of uh, public fatigue with COVID in the middle of the Omicron um, uh, surge, the, the convoy was able to come in and score uh, two political victories with relative ease. The first is that we've seen, we saw a faster drawdown of COVID restrictions on the part of Prairie governments in Ontario. And however you wanna spin it, that was a victory for the convoy. Uh, more quickly, we saw the political takedown of Aaron O'Toole and his efforts to smear liberal lipstick on the regressive conservative party. 
uh, another, and that was a very quick victory on the part of the convoy. And now we see, as Cam mentioned, uh, the march towards uh, essentially a Trumpy conservative party. The other uh, a key outcome, um, you know, even more dangerous is what we see is the, what I would call the advance of a fascist globalism. We see this mutual support and inspiration of uh, fascists and regressives across the Western world in particular, especially the inspiration uh, that Canadian uh, regressives draw from Trump nation. In fact, the convoy itself, I think we should see as being directly inspired by the multitude of MAGA uh, flag roll throughs through countless American cities during the 2020 uh, general election. The third outcome would be um, what I think is very clear is progressive liberal impotency. A large majority was opposed to the convoy and yet they couldn't uh, make their will uh, known unlike this um, minority with the convoy. Instead, the reaction of progressive liberals was a, a banal moralist sort of trust science finger wagging, uh, which is a, a political DOA response to a far right that has now acquired a mass base. And I think even expanded it here in BC, although of course conservatives uh, form the bulk uh, of the support of the convoy, we see in BC even the support of a number of, of Green Party members, including uh, candidates who ran in the last federal election. The progressive liberals utterly failed to and or and perhaps refuse to connect to a large majority of Canadians who are angry about the fact that the working majority has borne the costs of the COVID crisis and, uh, and are resentful of the fact that the divine holdings of the ultra rich have ballooned uh, during this time, not the least of which through uh, a direct handover of working class uh, taxpayer dollars. And yet, despite all of this, labor and even many leftists still pledge political support to right-wing uh, progressive uh, liberal parties. Uh, and if we look at the NDP, uh, the Liberals, the Greens, they support corporate free trade. They've supported uh, the massive uh, uh, capital uh, handouts during the COVID crisis. And, and so, and the political support coming from labor and leftists does not appear to have changed uh, despite that record. In terms of the implications of the convoy, uh, there's sort of three main points I want to touch on. First of all, more immediately, I think that there is a signal being given that's being picked up very quickly or and even being anticipated by the right wing establishment for a renewed war on unions and, uh, the, and, and the public sector. Um, we remember that uh, Kenny in Alberta during the occupation, particularly the one uh, in uh, the Mont Montana border crossing, he, was, he explicitly sicked the convoy partisans on the Alberta Federation of Labor for their meek support of a, uh, a court challenge uh, to the rescinding of, of masking regulations. Even before the convoy, we saw the National Post, which is the most right wing of, of the establishment newspapers, uh, screaming for accelerating, uh, quickening the pace of healthcare privatization during a pandemic, no less. And just recently, in the last week, we've seen an editorial from the Globe and Mail calling for uh, the slashing of old age pensions. Uh, we, when you're seeing all this money going towards uh, the richest corporations in the country, when you see all the money going towards war, uh, the war industry, uh, of course, it's going to be followed up by saying that unions, public service, and the working majority have to pay the costs of both the deaths, debts that are run up and also to get rid of social provision to feed um, the subsidization of capital. I think more broadly, we need to anticipate the danger of American annexation, uh, which I think is the most likely path to fascism in Canada. Uh, if we look at Wexit, even though Wexit was a bust uh, as an initial uh, right-wing response, there's a warning, a, a danger signal there. Uh, it was explicitly annexationist, really caught up in a delirium of an American worship. In fact, its key leader, uh, Peter Downing, sponsored a, a poster campaign in Alberta uh, under the, 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 uh, the label Alberta USA Foundation, adorned with Trump calling for Western provinces to join the United States. 
Um, this, this is about experimentation. They're trying things on. This is serious. Even though we can't anticipate exactly how and when it could happen, the Freedom Convoy showed an interest on the part of uh, the fascist section of the American ruling class in getting rid of the border and just directly coming in and taking over. And, and from there, all bets are off. Um, I think that the, the convoy was a dry run on what a takeover of the Capitol looks like, quite obviously. Uh, and I, you could envision that with, with support from sections of the police and the army, uh, from the media and the business class, annexation is a very real possibility and would uh, signal and spark a slide into outright uh, American inspired fascism. The, the last point I want to talk about in terms of implication, I know that this is more for the next forum, but I, I do think we need to, I, I would like to touch on it, is what are the implications for the organizing of a left-wing democratic movement that is sorely missing in this country and has been for a very long time? The, the idea of the deep recession that was uh, put on uh, the, the poster event, I think is, is quite accurate. Uh, you know, there's lots to say here, so I'll restrict myself to what I think are three key lessons, what we can learn, what we must learn from our far right enemies. Uh, the first is that um, they show a willingness to experiment uh, in, uh, in campaigns and initiatives, and they don't get discouraged by failure. Uh, the United We Roll convoy in 2019 was a flop. The first run of the PPC was a flop. The Maverick Party was a flop, and yet they didn't get discouraged they continue to come back at things. So with the convoy and with the PPC's performance in combining both elections with some direct action, they have scored some significant successes. Uh, and so there's something to be learned uh, uh, from that. Uh, we need to do our own experimentation in campaigns and initiatives that build political networks and organize public discontent around key issues for the working majority. So for COVID, for example, we need to urgently organize the battle against healthcare privatization and continuing austerity. The Liberal Party in 2017 carried out the Harper transfer cuts to healthcare in 2017 with really no opposition, certainly not from the NDP or the Greens, and no opposition uh, that I could see from the unions. We, we need to correct that. Uh, and, and we definitely can't rely on, on right wing progressive parties uh, to lead that. Uh, we need to look at, uh, we have to attack uh, the corporate welfare in the COVID measures, particularly the so-called wage subsidy, the payroll subsidy. We need to have a, a campaigns to abolish the profit looting in long-term care. Uh, the BC NDP government just recently, after promising in 2020 that they would expand public service and long-term care, have just recently renewed a large privatization uh, for profit contract. Uh, that's where things are going, and we have to fight that. The second uh, lesson is the, the far right has no problem uh, combining protests with politics, and they have no problem with exploring independent politics from establishment parties. And it's long time that, that it, it, it's long time coming that the left needs to engage in electoral combat in a serious way, especially at the local level. Uh, on the basis of determined uh, workplace and, and uh, community agitation. Uh, we need to end uh, both the servile uh, orientation towards the NDP, as well as the syndicalist refusal to engage in, in elections, which really just leaves the pro-corporate NDPs, their dominance in politics in place. We have to remember that elections are the only arena where the, where the, the mass of the public are engaged in public in politics. It's, it's not the way that we're going to democratize the country, but it is a key avenue of struggle that we have to engage in. Uh, and finally, uh, the last lesson that I, I think the left needs to take up quite vigorously is let's zero in on the weakness of the political ideas of the far right. It is significant that really uh, a, a weird assortment of very unappealing people with the most horrendous, obviously horrendous ideas were able to score such an easy political set of victories. We can zero in on their weaknesses. And, and I'll just restrict myself right now to their political ideas. I would see four key weaknesses that we should be taking up and really hammering on. First of all, is their worship of Trump America. 
Uh, it's tremendously discrediting amongst the majority in this country. Second is the, the, their support, their de facto support of corporate welfare exposes their lies in caring about ordinary people. And Cam talked about how uh, you know, they, there were many opportunities for them to take up issues uh, for truckers and so forth, and they couldn't give a damn. Um, the third is that their pursuit of the favor of an unelected Senate shows that the convoy is both highly anti-democratic and is entirely fine uh, with another form of grotesque corruption at the expense of the working majority. We need to hammer on that as well. Um, and I think in general, their free market fundamentalism is, uh, is a, a tremendous weak point. Their hatred of public health uh, and their desire to move towards the murderous thievery of the American private healthcare model. That's a terrible weakness. The majority in this country uh, support public health care. We should be fighting to democratize it and expand it. And, and we should be attacking the far right for the fact that they want uh, uh, Canada to continue, you know, to continue down the road uh, of American uh, privatizing, privatization and healthcare. Uh, so, with those uh, lessons in mind, I, you know, I certainly uh, I'm looking forward to engaging in the discussion here and uh, also in, in the third part of the forum. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. Uh... If you look through the chat, you'll see uh, you sparked a number of different ideas. Um, Alan reminded people, please, uh, in the chat, we need to keep our discussions uh, respectful of our speakers and uh, make sure we are attacking their political points and not waging uh, political attack or personal attacks or using uh, rude language. So please do that. Um, I. Uh, yeah, I think I agree. We definitely have to move move beyond just discussing the character of a convoy and talk about our response. So I appreciate your contributions to that important part of the discussion and helping us frame um, what are what are really the political points of this uh, business freedom convoy, as you called it, and and uh, how should the left respond? So our our next speaker uh, is situated not in Canada, which I think is an important. Uh, contribution uh, to this discussion that, of events happening in Canada to have some perspective uh, from people that are not not here but observing what is happening and and tying it to what is happening also internationally in response to capitalist and imperialist crisis. So our next speaker uh, is Jesus Rodriguez Espinosa. I just want to make sure he didn't drop off. He was going to having some internet issues. Oh, he's here. Okay, perfect. Uh, so Jesus Rodriguez Espinosa is an expert in international relations, Venezuelan politics and communication. He served for years as Consul General of Venezuela in Chicago in the United States. And prior to that, he was part of the foundational editorial team of the website aporea.org. He is the founder and editor of the Venezuelan progressive website Orinoco Tribune. Jesus, uh, welcome, and let's hope that the internet stays strong. Thank you, Alison. Yes, my internet is bumpy. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, yes, as you said, uh, we are I'm based in Caracas, uh, so we have a perspective. You know, we see the the convoy uh, from afar, but. Uh, but uh, in Orinoco Tribune, we has been trying to follow the, the, the convoy, the freedom convoy situation closely for different reasons. Uh, 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 one of those uh, is that uh, we have a, a, one of our editorial uh, co-editor, I mean, uh, one of our co-editors is a Canadian and he, he, he was very involved in the, in the, you know, in the following of the, of the of the of the convoy, and we have been trying to 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 you know to present our perspective uh, about the convoy and to follow it. So I I just want to start saying that that uh, I mean the the cost of the convoy is very complex, and it has created a lot of uh, frictions even among the left. Uh, and I just wanted the beginning to highlight, I know that maybe uh, we, we already have been, you know, uh, talk about that, but you know, the, the, the causes like the anti-vax 
you know, people or the people against the lockdowns or the people that are against authoritarianism or, you know, state, state repression, uh, you know, uh, are part of the, you know, igniters of this, uh, you know, social phenomenon that happened in, in, in Canada. And uh, uh, of course, COVID-19 exhaustion uh, is another uh, key element to have uh, in mind. And uh, I would add uh, that Big Pharma uh, is, uh, you know, the rejection of Big Pharma is another big uh, igniter uh, for the for the combo, if you ask me. So, you know, these are like four or five elements that uh, create, in our opinion, the environment for the convoy to, to have some sort of support even among left people. And, uh, and I wanted to highlight that because we have a, an important, uh, you know, uh, reader space in Canada that, that criticize us because we publish some you know, critic analysis about the convoy from a leftist perspective. Uh, and then, you know, when you engage in, 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 in that debate, you realize that there, for example, are people from the left that supported the convoy because uh, they uh, were against the, the lockdowns. And, 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 and that's absolutely understandable because uh, a lot of people got exhausted by the by covid but also got tired of the repressive uh, you know approach of some countries towards the pandemic so i believe that that created some sort of confusion among uh, not only among leftist people but i believe among among liberals that might have you know joined or supported the convoy so those things i believe have to be analyzed properly in order to to give uh, the convoy the right weight, you know, to analyze the, the, the support of the convoy uh, properly. So, so, so I, I just wanted to mention that because there is a lot of, you know, uh, confusion or, or discussions about those issues uh, uh, that uh, we as leftists uh, see, see them as something only happening uh, you know, within leftist circles, but uh, I'm pretty sure that that's something that is not affecting all, uh, only the left. Uh, it, it might be also affecting right-wingers and liberals that might have, you know, joined the, the, the Freedom Convoy. So, you know, within that framework, uh, one uh, would ask uh, uh, oneself, uh, what is the ideology behind the convoy? And, 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 and if you ask me, I, when you hear the speeches of the people, uh, at least the ones that I hear, heard, uh, uh, you, you, you notice that there might be some sort of anarchist uh, tendencies within the convoy. But also when you check the, the images, uh, you notice that there's also something like uh, related to anti-communist, fascist, uh, you know, uh, tendencies within the convoy, even something that no one talks too much about, but uh, uh, Steve Lala, uh, our co-editor that lives in, 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 in Canada, uh, mentioned us a lot, which are these Trudeau banners uh, with saying that he was a son of Fidel, and that's why people, you know, should join the convoy. I mean, that's like something pretty crazy, pretty like, you know, uh, uh, trying to drive people crazy, you know, because they were using those images, trying to encourage people to, you know, join the convoy, but using the, the communists, you know, ghost uh, and things like that, which is pretty, uh, I don't know, I don't know how to say it, like worrisome maybe. Uh, of course, we have the, and we can ask ourselves, I mean, in terms of ideology, I, I mean, were there working class people in the, in the, in the convoy? I mean, uh, were, were leftists joining the convoy? I mean, one can ask uh, oneself that questions. I don't see it pretty clear, but as I mentioned before, I believe that there might be some leftist uh, uh, people uh, for the reasons that I mentioned before that might have joined the, the convoy. 
uh, are uh, are they Trumpist? I believe that 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 that's the you know common opinion of the majority of the people, at least in the left. Uh, it, it is my opinion. I mean, I, I see like most of the speeches, the the nature of the you know the the complexion of the people that participate in those uh, demonstrations are were very similar to the ones you see in the pro trump uh, protests in the us so 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 i mean in my opinion they resembles a lot the trumpist movement uh, and that means uh, white supremacists, racist uh, uh, people. I was trying, you know, looking at some videos uh, uh, to to check if, you know, uh, there were black people or indigenous people in those protests, and I didn't see many. I see a few black people. I I, I believe that I I didn't see too many indigenous people or brown people. Uh, uh, but, but I'm not saying that they are, we're not there, but the majority of the people that I saw in all the protests and the videos that we have seen uh, are white, uh, you know, people. So um, uh, now, and you know, taking that into consideration, one has to question, uh, uh, could uh, the left, I mean, was the left capable to capture uh, and give real purpose to the convoy? I mean, I'm, I, I ask that question because uh, we have some readers that reach us and told us, and even some writers, uh, and, uh, I mean, uh, contributors that write in Orinoco Tribune that, that, that wrote about the, the, the mistakes of the Canadian left, not you know, taking advantage of the situation and you know, uh, taking leadership within the movement and, and, and 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 you know giving it uh, a little bit more of purpose you know uh, I, I i don't i don't see that very clear i don't see that, that i don't see that as an option but there were people talking about that uh, uh and one can ask oneself also i mean i uh, was the, uh maybe in that same line of thought uh one can ask uh, if the if maybe the left can be able to organize a real protest a real movement uh, to try to neutralize this you know craziness uh, and, and 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 really uh, move towards the, uh, the 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 real demands that the majority of the Canadians needs to defend to fight for so that's a question that one one have to ask uh, to the Canadian leftist to, to see uh, what happened because there might be also a problem of leadership within the left in Canada and 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 and, and one sh you know should question that or ask about that especially us that are not inside the the country and now I want to talk about something that has to deal with the international uh, scope of the of the of the freedom convoy i mean we have the freedom convoy in canada but we have uh, right now the national uh, nationwide freedom convoy or the people's convoy in the us and and those guys has been doing uh, uh moving organizing and, and mobilizing people in the us and 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 one wonders if uh, that's gonna you know become massive especially in the u.s uh, in preparations for the 2024 uh, presidential ca campaign in which uh, uh, everyone uh, sees trump running again as president for presidency so one have to ask oneself uh, about the possibility of the internationalization of the of the freedom convoy and that takes me to that you know uh, some friends of us also question what they call a fake or false dichotomy between conservative and liberals or Republican and Democrats uh, in relation to politics. I mean, I'm talking about the, 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 they call it a fake dichotomy because they say that this kind of debates, you know, criticizing the, the, the convoy or criticizing the, the riots in the Capitol Hill in, in Washington uh, are just distractions to keep uh, liberals and conservatives fighting among each other 
while the 1% uh, uh, keep uh, running the show and, 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 and taking all the money, sucking all the money they can from the system and impoverish, impoverishing people all over uh, our countries. So, so I mean, that's a, a, I believe that that's a, an important debate because, uh, I mean, uh, it's a reality that, uh, you know, when, when you see what happened in the U.S., with the Capitol Hill protest uh, uh, you, or, or, or rebellion, uh, however you want to call it, you notice that 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 there there's a lot of media attention towards those phenomena, and you wonder if 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 that is something that has been you know constructed uh, precisely to distract people's attention. So some friends of us talk about those sheen, those things, and I believe that it's important to to to, to you know, put the finger there because uh, there might be a, a, an explanation. I mean, there, there, there might be reasons behind that and, and maybe and we might, you know, try to, if we address those reasons, maybe we can find solutions to, you know, to fix the, or to re properly respond to the convoy or phenomenon similar to the convoy. Uh, and, and, and also another scene is how you uh, uh, control the, the exporting of the convoy. I mean, we saw in France, some incidents in relation to the convoy, and also in Australia, uh, some incidents uh, uh, trying to replicate the convoy idea in those countries. And, and one have to ask uh, also, uh, it also happened in Spain, but it was uh, kind of different because they were in the middle of a strike, but some people were trying to push also uh, uh, during that strike of, of truckers in Spain. Uh, there they, they were people trying to push the idea of, you know, organizing something similar to the freedom from voice. So, so I mean, one have to wonder uh, uh, how to balance between uh, not playing the game of the one percent, but also addressing the possibility of rejecting that kind of phenomena being replicated in other countries. And that now uh, takes me to Venezuela, in which we had, for example, the Guarimbas. And we have some friends that wrote in Canada that wrote a nice piece comparing the Guarimbas with the, with the, with the Freedom Convoy. And, and there were a lot of uh, people criticizing them because uh, 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 they say that uh, the, the, uh, the, the convoy were, was not as violent as the Guarimbas in Venezuela. Uh, uh, but even though they wrote that, uh, I mean, they noticed and they wrote about that difference in the piece, they were attacked because they co make that compar comparison between Guarimbas in Venezuela and the Freedom Convoy in Canada. But in reality, I mean, the Guarimbas are, in essence, very similar to the convoy because, I mean, the Guarimbas were this violent, called by the press, peaceful, but in reality, very violent protests that happen in Venezuela, has been happening in Venezuela in several uh, moments in our recent history. And, and basically, uh, middle-class people surround, I mean, they blockade their neighborhoods and they, and they basically uh, have everyone living inside certain areas blocked with noise, with, uh, uh, with some sort of uh, blockades, burning tires, and, and that kind of, uh, you know, uh, situations that are not, uh, uh, sometimes are not violent, but in reality, they are very violent because you, you, they have people kidnapped in the, in the, within their neighborhoods. And that somehow uh, uh, made me think a lot about what happened in, in Ottawa. So, 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 so I find that there's a connection between the, 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 the Guarimbas in Venezuela and the Freedom Convoy in, the, in, the, in Canada, this, this regarding the fact that maybe the levels of violence in each one were different. But uh, now I can ask myself, can some right-wingers in Venezuela try to uh, replicate a Freedom Convoy here? Or, or, you know, or, or trying to make evolve our guarimbas and connect them with trucks to try to create, uh, you know, more disruptions than the ones that they usually create. I mean, that's a real possibility that, that, that one has to uh, think about and, and that one has to, uh, to foresee 
in order to, uh, I mean, and, 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 and for that we need to, and, and, and I mean, for that reason, it is important to question and criticize what happened in Canada with the Freedom Convoy, because if we don't do that, uh, we will allow uh, the replication of that phenomena in other countries. So, so, so that's the the connection that that I wanted to 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 build between the between the the freedom convoy in Venezuela, uh, and and then there are different things that, that that I some questions to finish that I want to 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 raise. I mean, one is connected to the Emergency Act. I know that you already have talked about that. But uh, you know, uh, it, it was used as a scapegoat by some leftists to criticize those in the left, uh, criticizing the Freedom Convoy, and they say that uh, we in the left that were critics of the Freedom Convoy somehow uh, uh, were the blame uh, for the you know emergency act announced by Trudeau uh, by the end of February, I believe, or, or March. Uh, so. Um, so I mean that's another part of the, those cracks that we see within the the the, the left uh, towards the issue of the freedom convoy. What will happen with the Trudeau inquiry uh, on the Emergency Act? Something that I've been reading that I mean uh, one have to I mean I, I don't see it clear maybe because I'm I, I'm away a very far from Canada. But what will happen with that inquiry and, and what happened with the Rolling Thunder? thing that was mentioned before i mean we we see that that, that tendency remains now with bikes with motorcycles and things like that but 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 but, but i mean the, the seed of the freedom convoy is still there and the other question is uh, that that i that i ask myself is what will happen with the political scenario uh, within canada uh, uh, after the freedom convoy because you hear those you know uh, fights between Polivre, I don't know if I pronounce it well, or Chavez, uh, uh, and, and you and you and you see that there is some, uh, you know, some some politicians taking credit uh, and and moving up in the you know support of some people just yes, because they were supported supportive or not of the freedom convoy. So those are questions that I raise there. I'm the one. I, I I'm open to I'm open to I'm gonna finish with this and I'm uh, I will happy to answer some questions at the end. Thank you, Jesus. Um, reminder to folks: make sure you're on mute. Um, just uh, thank you for making those connections and and let, helping us take a step back to see how the convoy was perceived outside of Canada and why it might have implications outside of Canada. Also, of course, um, based on what's been happening in the United States and uh, really kind of the main political actor internationally we know is, is the US and its, its repercussions here in Canada and around the world uh, when it comes to this responding to the deepening capitalist crisis. Um, our next speaker also is not um, physically located here in Canada, but uh, is a, a leading journalist, and I'm really looking forward to his contributions. So he'll be our final speaker of the panel, and then we'll have some short announcements where people can collect their thoughts, and then we'll do a QA and a uh, where people will be able to raise their hands and ask questions. Uh, Benjamin Norton is a journalist, a writer, a filmmaker, founder and editor of the independent media outlet Multipolarista, where he reports in both English and Spanish. His journalism focuses primarily on U.S. foreign policy and geopolitics, and he has reported from many countries around the world uh, and is currently based in Latin America. My pleasure to invite uh, Ben Norton to close off our panel today. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. I really enjoyed listening to all of the analysis and I look forward to the questions. I think we should understand the convoy in Canada as part of a larger international phenomenon. And while the neoliberal order is collapsing, this is the stage of capitalism that developed in the late 70s, the 1980s with Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, of course, and it became international. I think when we see the collapse of neoliberalism, <clears throat> there are several different responses. There is, of course, the progressive 
socialist critique of neoliberalism, but there are increasingly are right wing critiques of neoliberalism that are gaining influence. And you could also say that they're not just right wing, they are far right and even fascistic critiques of neoliberalism. And I think in Canada, this is a, an example of what we've seen in the United States really in the past several years. And I, I think the analysis that several other panelists had, had provided of the possibility of a fascist regime in the United States trying to absorb, to annex, to colonize Canada, I think actually is not a crazy idea at all. I think that's actually something that is, is quite plausible. And we should also understand that these far right networks in North America and internationally are well connected. And specifically in the case of Canada, one of the most prominent influential fascist organizations in the United States was founded by a Canadian, by Gavin McInnes, who founded the Proud Boys, which is a fascist gang in the US that has been implicated in hate crimes and violence. And, and Gavin McInnes refers to himself as a Western chauvinist. But I think Gavin McInnes is an interesting character because I think he kind of reflects this phenomenon, phenomenon that I was addressing of a right wing far right response to neoliberalism. And we see this in the United States with the attempt to try to create this concept of the populist right. And I think, you know, the word populism itself is extremely arbitrary. It is never clearly defined. It certainly is not a form of class politics. In fact, usually populism is, is a, is a cross-class politics that calls on people to unite, you know, workers with the capitalists in, in pursuit of some cultural goal that distracts from you know, historical materialist reality. And we see this so clearly with the attempt in the United States to try to create this idea of a populist right, not only with Donald Trump, who is frequently referred to as a populist, but now with this new generation of Republicans who fancy themselves intellectuals, although, I mean, uh, you know, how many books they've actually read is, is quite, uh, I think, up for debate. Like J.D. Vance is someone I'm thinking of. This guy, J.D. Vance, has portrayed himself as a populist Republican. He just won the primary for the Republican Party in Ohio, which is a state that is contested. It's known as a purple state between the Republicans and the Democrats. J.D. Vance, who actually got his start criticizing Appalachia from a cultural perspective, not an economic critique of the, the uneven development, development within the United States in terms of how Appalachia was exploited by the fossil fuel industry, specifically the coal industry. He wrote this book, Hillbilly Elegy, that was a culturalist critique of the economic backwardness of Appalachia that framed it in the terms of, in terms of people supposedly being lazy and, and basically kind of reiterating this, this kind of, these stereotypes of, of poor people supposedly not working hard enough. J.D. Vance later rebranded as a, an ardent Trump supporter after initially criticizing Trump and a so-called populist right winger, populist Republican. And he has even gone so far as to critique elements of neoliberal orthodoxy. And he's not the only one. We've also seen far right figures like Tucker Carlson, who has the, the most popular, at least in terms of ratings, the most watched TV show in the United States on Fox News. Tucker Carlson, likewise, has been called a so-called populist and does have a far right critique of neoliberalism. And these critiques tend to be critiques that criticize neoliberalism for, and even elements of capitalism, for instance, for allowing liberalization of immigration policy, for encouraging women to join the marketplace. Of course, not, not to join the workforce, not of course, because capitalists care in any way about women's rights on the contrary, but, this is a right wing critique of neoliberalism and even capitalism for breaking down feudal relations. So in, in many ways, this kind of so-called populist right or these far right movements are in some ways even neo feudal. And I think there's definitely a way we can analyze fascism as having elements of neo feudalism. So in terms of the trucker convoy, the so-called trucker convoy organized by non truckers funded by people outside of Canada, largely, especially in the United States. And we have reports now showing that the funding from the United States to the convoy in Canada came disproportionately from wealthy suburbs that are the bases for Donald Trump and the Republican Party. So this is clearly a concerted attempt to try to create this concept of a so-called populist right. And Justin Trudeau, in many ways, 
is the perfect target for them. This is a, a man who is thoroughly neoliberal. His economic pro program is in no way progressive, and I'm sure no one here actually supports Trudeau, despite the supporters of the convoy trying to portray leftist critics of the convoy as supposed Trudeau supporters. And Trudeau is also the perfect target in the sense of he has mastered this, this new politic of these liberal politicians who will instrumentalize very important struggles like the struggle against patriarchy and racism and LGBT oppression, but doing so within a thoroughly neoliberal framework and a thoroughly imperialist framework, supporting the, the, the right wing US led Trump led coup attempt against Venezuela and acting on behalf of the United States in the so called Lima group to overthrow the leftist government of Venezuela. Also supporting the war in Yemen by and supplying weapons to Saudi Arabia to help carry out this war that has led to at least 377,000 Yemeni deaths. So Trudeau is in many ways the perfect target because he is in no way a, a left wing politician, but he does use this kind of progressive identitarian rhetoric which allows this so-called populist right, which is also, also in many ways uh, neoliberal, despite their critiques of neoliberalism, they have no economic program to actually challenge neoliberalism other than some critiques of corporate culture, criticizing corporations for supposedly being woke because some corporations have found that it's in their economic interest to criticize racism or police brutality or something because they're trying to go after many young customers and young people tend to be very susceptible to these critiques of systemic racism and you know uh, the horrible uh, outcomes that we've seen of capitalism and neoliberalism in North America. So I, I also think it's important to understand those critiques in a larger international context. And here in the last few minutes of my presentation, I want to take that analysis even further from, from the bogus attempt to, to create a so-called populist right that has no economic program and tries to move all political struggle onto a cultural terrain, into the so-called culture war, and has effectively instrumentalized critiques of the failure of the neoliberal response to this global pandemic. I mean, we don't see, of course, critiques of the US government for allowing more than 1 million people to die from COVID. Of course, the, instead the critiques are that, you know, people had to wear masks to the extent that they even did in many of these parts of the United States, they didn't have to, or that they, in some places they had to get vaccinated. Although again, in the US that was never really implemented in many states, but th that, that also helps them keep the struggle away from the economic terrain and to focus on these cultural battles in, in the so-called culture war. But I think we also need to understand that this is a, an international phenomenon, not just limited to North America, where we see the rise of attempts to create a, a so-called populist right that has some critiques of neoliberalism, but fails to implement any economic alternative. We see this in Eastern Europe with figures like Viktor Orban in Hungary or in Poland with the, the Law and Justice Party, which make these vague critiques of big corporations and neoliberal policies. Well, in many ways, their economic policies are also thoroughly neoliberal, but they justify those from a conservative political framework. And some of these parties have even fancied themselves social conservative parties. And I think, again, we can, we should, we can see this, uh, you know, the so-called convoy as something that, that comes in a similar line of this attempt to try to create this this vague veneer of a right, a political right that is anti-establishment. They love using the term anti-establishment. They don't say against the ruling class. They certainly don't say against the capitalist class. They're against this vague concept of the establishment. And then they try to argue that the, the bourgeoisie is thoroughly liberal. And of course, it is liberal if you understand liberalism as what it actually means. But of course, when they say liberal, they mean liberal with a capital L. And the reality is that they're also liberals with a lowercase l, which is why they, they have a critique of neoliberalism but are unable to break out of the economic model of neoliberalism because their critiques are, are not economic critiques. And, and I think the most interesting parallel here is looking also at Brazil. And I mentioned in Eastern Europe with the rise of these so-called social conservative parties, but Brazil is another interesting example of that. I mean, India also, by the way, I should say, which is a whole other concept uh, for another time, uh, the BJP party, which is a far right party, which is also thoroughly neoliberal, 
has tried to make these similar critiques while, we're, while also in no ways actually diverging from the neoliberal model. And we've even seen that some of these supporters of the far right Hindutva movement in India have even tried to make a right wing critique of colonialism by basically saying that if you oppose this chauvinist idea of creating a Hindu Rashtra, a Hindu state against the large Muslim minority and other religious minorities in, in India, well, it's because you're a racist and you're a Hindu phobe and you're a, you're a colonialist who is against the pure Hindu culture of, of Hindustan of India. So another way in, in which this so-called populist right has, has manifest itself internationally. And I want to keep in mind here that what does BJP mean in, in Hindi? It means the, the People's Party of India, which is, again, we see this around the world. We see in Canada, the so-called People's Party, which tries to portray itself as so-called populist, which is also economically neoliberal, but and it's far right, but portrays itself as uh, you know oppositional to neoliberalism. And finally, the last example I'm going to end my, converse, my discussion with here is is that of Brazil. And I think this is the most interesting example in terms of the direct parallels to the convoy in Canada. Again, a convoy led by non-truckers in which the main organizers were far-right Canadian operatives in a country in which 90% of truckers are vaccinated and in which all of the major unions, including Teamsters, the leading truckers union, came out forcefully against this convoy. And, and briefly here, I just want, if I can share my screen, I just want to um, show an article briefly. I'm just going to summarize it in short. An article that I published on my website, Multipolarista, which was co-written by a, a friend and colleague of mine, Brian Mir, who is a longtime Brazilian, uh, Brazil-based journalist. He's lived in Brazil for over half his years, for over 30, over half his life, for over 30 years. And he originally comes from the United States. And actually, interestingly, his brother is a trucker. And he, he knows very well about the horrible conditions that truckers are, subjugate, uh, are subjected to in North America, having to work long hours with few benefits, with decreasing wages. So uh, this article is interesting because Brian used his, his experience in Brazil to talk about the very many parallels between the convoy in Canada and similar, uh, in, uh, similar things that happened in Brazil and for People uh, want to look this up on, you can find this at Multipolarist. It's called From Canada to Brazil, Rich, rich Right-Wing Elites Are Astroturfing So-Called Trucker Protests. I want to go down here to a photo of Brazil's far-right president, fascist president in the middle, Jair Bolsonaro, who only came to power in 2018 because the United States backed a judicial coup that imprisoned the left-wing candidate Lula da Silva on completely bogus charges. And now the UN Human Rights Committee, the legal experts at the UN, have, have determined that Lula was arbitrarily detained and that it violated his political rights. This photo show, shows Bolsonaro with his son, Eduardo, but it also shows him with a former Trump advisor who is a close ally of Steve Bannon. His name is Jason Miller. Steve Bannon has helped to create these far-right networks, these neo-fascistic networks, and he's been very active in Brazil, in Europe, and they organized a very similar so-called trucker protest in Brazil just a few months ago. And in this article, we talk about how in September, there was a meeting of the so-called Conservative Political Action Conference, CPAC, which is a right-wing conference in the United States held every year. And they exported that with the same name. They even used the English language name. They didn't even translate it into Portuguese. They called it CPAC Brazil. And this conference featured Bolsonaro's son, Eduardo, seen on the right in this photo. It also featured Donald Trump Jr. He was supposed to speak in person, but he ended up being delayed and actually spoke via video stream. But the point is that it brought together the son of Donald Trump and the son of Bolsonaro, both of these far-right presidents. And this, this, was, this, this CPAC Brazil conference came just a few days before an organized protest that was modeled after the January 6th insurgency in the US Capitol in which Trump supporters, you know, they, they raided the US Capitol and tried to overturn the election results. And in Brazil, they, did, they tried to do something very similar in September where they capitalized the, they paralyzed the capital Brazil, uh, excuse me, they uh, not, not capitalized, the, the, they paralyzed the capital Brasilia and then thousands of Bolsonaro supporters stormed the Supreme Court building 
And this is also part of an attempt to try to rig the elections on behalf of Bolsonaro. So once again, we see parallels here where the far right is international. They're working together. There are some of the same people involved in these networks, including people like Steve Bannon and allies like Jason Miller. And then and it, what's very important about this event is not only was it modeled after January 6th in the United States, but it was also an attempt to, to instrumentalize the concept of uh, trucker rights, the idea that truckers are uh, you know, being oppressed. Uh, well, I mean, ironically, Bolsonaro was president, but this goes back to they, they say that these policies created by the, the Workers' Party and all of this, uh, they supposedly violate the rights of truckers. When they say truckers, they mean owner operators. They mean not working class truckers. They mean their bosses who hire them to drive the actual buses. And we saw that at this, this attempt to storm the Supreme Court building, there was this big protest featuring dozens of identical trucks. And it was later disclosed that these trucks were all, they all belonged to one of the main campaign funders of Jaro Bolsonaro, whose name is Marlon Bonilla. And this, this so-called trucker protest, it was organized by a man who calls himself Se Throwout. That's not his real name. That's just the, the uh, nickname he gave himself. And it was later revealed that not only was he not a trucker, he didn't even have a driver's license, but he did receive thousands of dollars from Bolsonaro's son, Eduardo. And here in the article, you can see this is a photo. And he, what he did, this guy, this Bolsonaro supporter, Se uh, Throwao, he called himself a trucker. He put, he put on this hat and he wore a vest. It's also similar to the vest used in the, the yellow vest protest in France, which is another complex discussion, but it's related to this. And he had a big Brazilian flag behind him in these YouTube videos. And he had these long rants about cultural Marxism and the Workers' Party and how they're destroying the country. And he said, I'm a worker, I'm a trucker, and join me in the capital, Brasilia, and we're going to fight on behalf of freedom and all this nonsense. Of course, as I said, it was late. Here, here's an example of their, their, uh, you know, their rhetoric of these truckers who, again, they were hired by a main a multimillionaire who's one of the main donors to Jair Bolsonaro. And they had these large banners that were professionally, uh, professionally printed that said, we demand a new federal constitution that incorporates anti-communism. They wanted to make it illegal to be a communist, which, by the way, which was incorporated into Ukraine after the U.S.-backed coup in 2014. So we see how much uh, the, the liberal so-called rules-based international order cares about civil liberties for the left. But uh, anyway, finally concluding here, this is some of the reporting from Brian Muir that shows, again, the, the direct parallels between these strategies used by the far right internationally. Exactly what they were doing in Canada is exactly what they were also doing in Brazil. Here you can see a photo of Marlon Bonilla, the multimillionaire owner of the trucking company called ProTorque that brought dozens of trucks to the Capitol for this protest. And here's a photo of him giving Jair Bolsonaro a motorcycle helmet. And then here he talks about this guy, Se Trovao, and he quotes the, a strike leader who was president of a transport strike. And he says he's referring to this guy who was called himself a trucker and led the so-called trucker protest in Canada. He said, this guy made a video inside of a truck, but we don't know him. I've been in this business for 22 years. This guy just arrived by parachute. So the reason I wanted to go into that example is because we need to understand that these tactics being used in Canada are not novel. The far right is international. This attempt to create a so-called populist right, as cynical as it was, as I talked about earlier, is international. And not only are they using the same tactics, many of the same networks and individuals are involved in organizing backing these campaigns. Thank you, uh, Ben Norton, um, for that contribution. And uh, again, also, yes, this international uh, viewpoint of what is happening and uh, really the the crux of it being in the the capitalist crisis um, splitting in the ruling class in the United States uh, which as I uh, mentioned before and I think we've tied together through all the panels I think is going to continue that's one of the reasons why this discussion is so important is because we're going to see continuing and more actions uh, like we saw in Canada Brazil in Venezuela or in um, the United States itself so uh, 
really looking forward to a discussion. Uh, I appreciate all of our panel speakers. That was really fantastic. Uh, we're gonna have some short announcements and then people can raise their hands in order to speak. Um, you can, of course, also type a question, but if you'd like to ask it yourself, that's fine. Um, I'll try and take a representative um, speakers list over in the chat. Uh, but first I wanted to welcome Radhika Desai, who's gonna make an announcement on behalf of one of the organizers of today's panel. Uh, thank you very much, Alison. So I'd like to make two very brief announcements. So firstly, uh, I want to say that I'm Radhika Desai. I happen to serve as the president of the Society for Socialist Studies. And I'm very happy to say that the society has been sponsoring this and other such events. So please watch out for us. We, uh, You can find us at www.socialiststudies.ca. I'm going to put the link in the chat. We are basically an organization. We started out as an organization of both activists and academics, and we are trying to return to that sort of mix of activism and academics. So please consider, please look at our website. Please consider becoming a member. We have a sliding scale of membership, so uh, it's a uh, fairly uh, easy if you, you know, if most people can afford it, the overwhelming majority of people will be able to afford it. And um, we hold such events and we are also trying to create a Canada wide network of left wing scholars and activists, which I'm sure everybody who's here will agree is really an important thing to do in our time at this point when we have so many dangers facing us on the one hand, an increasingly aggressive right wing and on the other hand, a liberal establishment that doesn't seem to be able to stand up to it or do or pursue policies that is able to prevent the rise of such things. So that's about the Society for Socialist Studies. We run a journal, which is also open access. So you will find lots of free articles, uh, really interesting about Canada's politics and political economy. So www.socialiststudies.ca. The second thing I wanted to say is uh, that one of the, you know, we have, we are holding these three panels and uh, Brendan Devlin in particular has been very active in organizing all the panels. And I'd like to say that he has established contact with a, uh, uh, with a organization called the Now Jawan Support Network. Uh, the, it is a grassroots group that organizes international students and migrant workers, particularly from South Asia in Ontario, and they have successfully won back stolen wages for immigrant truckers. You may not know this, but many people have talked today about how the truckers, uh, you know, the most most of the truckers who are working class truckers, who are work, worker truckers, many of whom are non-white, uh, they are not included in this. In fact, they are obviously excluded. And in fact, their real problems, including the, 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 the theft of wages, are not addressed. So now Joanne Support Network works for them and among them. And they have really delivered for truckers, workers, and international students. They We are hoping to have a representative from their organization speak at our panel. Uh, we, we will confirm when the third panel is. Uh, but it will be really good for you to please consider uh, uh, making a donation to them. They have a GoFundMe page and I'm going to just copy uh, and paste the link in the chat for everyone. So that's all from me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Radhika. And Alan Freeman, you have an announcement as well about the International Manifesto Group. So I hope everybody can hear me. Hi, I'm Alan Freeman with Radhika and many other people. We organize the International Manifesto Group. And I just want to list a series of things you can do if you like these discussions and you want us to extend them. Um, first of all, we go on YouTube and please do share the YouTube videos. And also I'm told by fellow vloggers that you should like them because apparently YouTube has uh, jigged its algorithms so that shares don't draw it to the attention of other people anymore. But if you like them, I mean, eventually they'll catch on, but that helps get it out to other people. So that's the first thing. Secondly, we're a volunteer organization and in the chat, I've posted uh, a, a, an address. You can click on that and you can volunteer. There's an enormous amount of work and uh, we're expanding very rapidly. We also work very closely with other people, which takes a lot of work, but is very necessary for the left to come together. Uh, and, and, and discuss out its ideas. So uh, click, click there. And of course, you can donate 
And we regret that at present, the uh, only two methods of donating by internet is either to go by PayPal or, and it's very important to stress this, you can use a credit card, even though it appears to be a PayPal account, it's not. It's just servicing the credit card itself. We are trying to move. We don't like PayPal for many reasons that, you know, not least that they have started to close down people who do things that the State Department doesn't like, their stand on uh, Palestinians and so on. We are moving away from it. That will take time. You can also, people have asked this, you can send checks. And if you want to do that, just contact us via the contact page on the Manifesto Group site. Send us an email and, and we'll, we'll tell you how to do that. So with that thank you very much for supporting us thank you to all the participants and to Alison for a wonderful seminar and I look forward to the question and answer sessions excellent thank you Alan uh, and to all of the event organizers and co-sponsors the Society for Socialist Studies the International Manifesto Group uh, the Fireless Time Movement for Social Justice the Canada Files and Canadian Dimension uh, just two uh, more short announcements. Uh, one is May 12th, there is an online Venezuela solidarity action demanding US Canada hands off Venezuela, end sanctions on Venezuela and freedom for Alex Saab. There will be speakers from the United States, uh, Canada, Quebec, and also direct from Venezuela, including Nelson Herrera, who is the uh, secretary of the vice presidency for the working class of the United Socialist Party of Venezuela. I've just put uh, this uh, information for registering on the chat. It is taking place on May 12th at the, uh, on Zoom at 4 p.m. Pacific time, co-organized by the Fire This Time Movement for Social Justice Venezuela Solidarity Campaign, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Venezuela Peace Committee in Winnipeg, and uh, Just Peace Advocates, among other groups and individuals. Uh, then on June 15th, there's a round table by the Society of Socialist Studies on fossil capitalism, climate breakdown, and green left strategies, uh, featuring myself, Alison Bodine, as well as Emily Eden and Robert Neubauer from the Corporate Mapping Project, and Tamara Lorenz, uh, who writes about uh, the links between the military and environmental breakdown, uh, as well as others to be announced taking place Wednesday, June 15th at 4 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. Eastern, which I will also put in the chat. And then keep uh, your eyes and ears peeled uh, for the next panel three of um, what uh, the Freedom Convoy discussion today. So uh, we will now go into our uh, question and answer period of discussion. I asked people to try and keep your comments to a few minutes at most and uh, do address questions to the panel. I'm also conscious that Gabriel let us know that he does have to leave in about 15 minutes. So we'll give him a chance to wrap up before he heads out. Uh, but uh, I will um, go ahead and ask uh, Yori to go first and then we'll do Marjolina, who I've heard has been trying for a while to be in the chat. So we'll take those two comments first, Yori and Marjolina, please. Okay, uh, one moment. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Ms. Fodzine. Uh, okay, so uh, my question is to uh, Mr. Norton, but anyone on the panel can comment on this, which is why have so many left-leaning folk and anti-imperialist thinkers, specifically from the US and the, and the UK, why do they have this sort of, you know, COVID minimalist, COVID is just like the flu or this sort of COVID denialist uh, thinking when it comes to the pandemic and what does it have to take for some of us on the left to uh to you know recognize the red flags which there were many with the freedom convoy uh i think was clearly a far right reactionary libertarian movement uh but but so many but so many people seem to just you know, overlook that just like you know Brexit or the support of Trump or the Euromaidan movements. And all that being said, because of the resistance to you know mandates and the vaccine and stuff like that, don't we then on the left have to advocate that we need to go back to a six to seven month uh, lockdown? But that being said, we bail out the workers, we bail out businesses. Uh, 
we compensate uh, businesses and, you know, and, and we simply, you know, have a people's uh, bailout until such a safe vaccine, uh, uh, you know, is made. And yeah, curious, anyone's uh, thoughts to that. Great. Thank you, Yuri. Uh, Margelina, are you able to speak? I'll ask you to unmute. Maybe that will prompt. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, very good. Um, well, my main point really is that I had expected maybe a hint of self-criticism coming from the participants uh, about the role of the left, the so-called left, Canadian left in particular, of uh, allowing the, uh, basically causing the, the envoy to, to exist. If the left would have been present, from the very beginning of the so-called lockdown, the kind of global tyranny, the way it manifested itself in Canada, there would have been no uh, trucks needed. You would have resisted from the very beginning the mandates, the horrible mandates that are continuing today, by the way, they are not lifted, they're lifted sporadically, they're lift, they lifted a bit, uh, piecemeal, and, and basically today we can't travel, we are forced to take vaccines, vaccines. We have to wear masks. I can't go. I'm speaking for myself in Saskatchewan. I can't go to any place. I can't, I have to have, the, any business can demand a vaccine passport today. Uh, you know, so there's, there's, I can't see my relatives across the country. You know, I can't even travel in Saskatchewan. <laughs> you know, because if, if I don't wear a mask, I can be kicked off a bus, which has happened. So the absolutely unwilling to participate in any kind of resistance. So analysis from the beginning, it has accepted public health rules. It, it, it has been the, the enforcer of them, uh, the castigators, uh, that they, they immediately condemning people who have, who have asked questions, not just asked questions, but resisted physically. In my case, I can't wear a mask because I will, you know, I cannot wear a mask and therefore I cannot even get health care. I'm, I'm denied that. And I'm, I'm not the only person in the country. And left has basically scorned me and thousands of others. And therefore, when there was an opportunity to express ourselves about the mandates, which the truckers did, and, and the, some of them were truckers and others were not, but it doesn't matter because it, people responded to that. I shouldn't have responded. Thank heaven, somebody is raising the issue about getting rid of the mandates. The left was crawling away and supporting the, every government restriction and they're bad mouthing us along with the media. You know, media has given them the narrative and the left has followed it. And even today, when you introduce the topic, you were basically quoting from the media about the terrible things that the, the, the convoy people did in Ottawa, which they didn't do. You know, so this is the left's responsibility has to be discussed. But Thank I don't you. think the people today are capable of doing that because you're, you're basically denying that role and you're just looking for more people to blame. And I expect, as an independent leftist, think from way back. I expected something. I got nothing. And don't thank do you, the Marjorie. third one, please, because that's yeah. I, I think, thank you. That's clear. Um, the audio is cutting out a bit. Your internet bandwidth is low. Um, but I think the yeah. point is well taken. The question is there. Thank you very much. Um, would any of the panelists like to be first to respond to some of the questions that have been raised? Um, Go ahead and start speaking if if you would like I, to. I, sure, I don't. Yeah. I don't yeah. mind. I, I don't. I, I don't. I, I don't mind starting. Um, I wanted to very brief. Uh, to to I, I know you you address Ben specifically, Yuri, but I uh, w as regards the um the how to say the vaccine skepticism and some of the anti uh, mandate talking points of. Um, let's say the anti-imperialist left of the imperial core, because this is where I see this happening. And I think that there's something there, um, particularly where the, uh, you know, the very uneven geographies of, of COVID are concerned, do you know? 
um, the uh, the failure of Canada to follow through on its uh, obligation to the COVAX program and so on, vaccine apartheid. These are very serious issues um, that index disparities, you know, and, and 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 imperialism to different degrees. So I think it's an unfortunate oversight that a lot of people seem to have succumbed to this very liberal, uh, libertarian, properly way of 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 of, of thinking, but. I think that there's 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 two things that are happening, and one is that in um, and um, even extreme incredulity of the state as it administers to people, and I also think that there's in, in some sense. Um, an incredulity of the commodity form itself, you know, where everything is cleaved. If you talk about the profit motive that has infiltrated um, healthcare in general, you know, um, it, 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 it's, it's multifaceted. The vaccine, uh, the vaccine commodity, you know, on one hand has a, has a, has a utility, perhaps it, uh, it, 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 it's substance is that it produces antibodies and pre prevents hospitalization. And that's, that's quite salutary. And then on, on the other face of it, um, it is uh, a method of uh, profiteering. And I think that people are um, discounting the former function you know, because of, of the infiltration of this essential care by, by the, by the profit motive. And that's just a, that's just a, a, a very typical operation of, 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 of capitalism. So I think that, um, people are, are sort of duped at this, at this very basic, like phenomenological level on, on, in a sense. Um, and then I, I wanted to jump in, um, Marlena, I, I heard, I heard most of what you said. I want to clarify that, uh, as I said in, in my presentation, I, I'm not for the mandates as they existed. I think that they pose very serious problems to uh, uh, equity. I think that they constricted nominally public space in, in, in very unfortunate ways. I, I think that the ways in which the convoy thematized the mandates and seized upon this topic was very transparently not about the mandates. I think we make a mistake when we, we reduce this to the single issue of mandates. Uh, many people have pointed out that the convoy didn't do a very good job of confronting the state response to COVID-19 in any other respect, you know? I think that it's quite obvious on the ground. You know, there were white supremacist symbols being trampled into the into the lawn of the legislature bill uh, of the legislature in Winnipeg, where I am. This is not uh, this is not solely the concern of of the convoy. And then the other thing I wanted to say to that end is I'm not an independent leftist. I'm a member of the Communist Party of Canada, and uh, we came out against the you know we we had a quite nuanced statement about the mandates quite early on. Quite early on, we opposed the mandates as such, and uh, we called upon Canada to address vaccine apartheid and to meet its obligation to the COVAX program. And uh, we wanted more education and outreach to racialized communities and low income communities and marginalized people. And we wanted, um, you know, real health care for a people's recovery that didn't, uh, you know, compel anybody, you know, and, 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 and our statement was mischaracterized. But, uh, you know, long before, long before the convoy opportunistically seized upon this talking point, uh, I, I like to think that I belong to a section of the left that, uh, that did approach this with some concern for, for people's misgivings, but also for the public health. So, so that, that, that would be my response. Before, I'll, I'll go ahead. Uh, sorry, Ben, would it be okay if Gabriel uh, wrapped up? Because Yeah, go ahead. Leave? Okay, thank you. So Gabriel, if you'd like to wrap up and add any comment to what has been asked before, that would be great. And then we'll go to Ben. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, Elson. Um, I mean, I think if we look at what's going on here politically in Canada, there is no coherent mass left. Uh, generally, the, what is called the left is conflated with progressive liberalism, which is 
gone further and further in support uh, of corporate enrichment uh, policies and, and respecting the fact there are smaller uh, left-wing uh, parties and groups like the Communist Party. Uh, we don't see a, a mass left. And definitely there's been a retreat during the era of, of COVID, um, a retreat away from any sort of in-person uh, organizing, even though uh, there are opportunities and ways to do it, distancing, masking, and, and so forth. Um, so that's something that uh, you know needs, needs to be addressed. Uh, the convoy in no way addresses uh, the critical issues uh, facing the majority of people around COVID or anything else. As I mentioned earlier, they're silent and therefore quite clearly supportive of corporate welfare. They, they uh, essentially moon after uh, a corrupt unelected Senate. Um, so I think it's right to oppose it. Um, but it's also correct to say that the left has provided, such as it is, uh, has provided a no coherent alternative. A forum like this is one way you could, we could begin to, to formulate uh, some kind of response. Uh, the, main, uh, the other thing I wanted to comment on is uh, the, the comments I made around annexation. I, I, Brighton, I see, is up uh, to speak uh, uh, soon. I uh, took some issue with that. Um, and I just want to speak to that because I used to uh, run the free trade uh, debate in 1988 uh, the anti-free trade uh, forces, which was led by uh, Canadian labor, actually talked about an overt American takeover. And I remember being fairly dismissive of that at the time, thinking like you've commented, uh, Brighton, well, the Americans already have so much control over the, over the economy and you know, over uh, the politics of the country. They don't need to take over. Well, just because they don't need to take over, in, in a sense, doesn't mean that there isn't a section of the American ruling class that actually would want that anyway. You know, when Trump talked about how uh, he didn't understand why uh, the Americans didn't just steal all the Iraqi oil after invading, which actually they did, but when he complained about that, that shows the mentality of, I think, a section of the American class that just sees things in a very blunt, instrumentalist way. Yes, they have control right now effectively over Canadian oil, but they also have to follow regulations and tick boxes and jump hoops. There's a section that would just like to do away with that. Um, and, and as terrible as social policy here is in Canada, I think we've learned uh, over the last 40 years that things can always get worse. And in fact, current trends show that it can get worse. That whether there's outright annexation or not, the trend towards further Americanization in terms of privatization of healthcare, education, and so forth, uh, that continues. That's very much inspired by American privatized models. And so, you know, we really do need to anticipate uh, the threat of annexation. And we certainly need to oppose further Americanization, not based on some idealization of Canada or of Canadian nationalism, uh, and certainly not its colonial character, but to say that as terrible as Canada is, becoming more like the United States makes it worse and worse day by day. And we need to oppose that. Uh, so, uh, you know, I appreciate the time um, uh, that the organizers uh, have put into uh, uh, having this forum and for everyone uh, here today. And I do wish all, all the mothers out there uh, a happy Mother's Day. Thank you. Great, thank you, uh, Gabriel. And uh, I look forward to continuing this uh, work together and uh, thanks for joining. Um, so the next, uh, Ben, you were going to speak. Go ahead. Yeah. In response to questions about uh, the idea of the left falling for COVID denialism and uh, anti-vax you know, ideas and all these things. Well, first of all, I mean, I don't think that critique is necessarily wrong, but we also have to be more specific in defining what the left is. And I'm really tired of all these vagaries in general, I'm not talking about this panel, I'm talking about in general, in the past several years, people become very sloppy in their critiques of the so called left. And one person says the left, and they mean something completely different from another person, I think we have to be much more specific in our criticisms. And, you know, when we're talking about the left, if you truly are a so called leftist, which again, is not a specific term, if you're a socialist, and you believe in the struggle against capitalism and imperialism, you understand that's a collective struggle. And you should be involved in a party or an organization or a movement. So we need to be talking more specifically about 
left-wing parties and movements and organizations. And if we look at their statements on COVID, if we look at their actions on COVID, I think many of them have been quite accurate. I think many of them have been quite good. So there are a few random individuals who are not part of an organization, not part of a party, not part of a movement, who call themselves you know, independent leftists or claim to be on the left or whatever, whatever that means. And they have some odious views and reactionary views and have been trying to force other people on the left to adopt those views. And I think there's a few reasons why. And I've, I've thought a lot about this. First of all, I think one of the main reasons is the opposition in all forms to the bourgeois state with the, with the idea that everything that the bourgeois state does by definition is inherently bad. And this shows an anarchist current, a libertarian current within Again, this vague idea of the Western left, especially in the United States, we saw this clearly uh, to, to a lesser extent in Canada and also a bit in Western Europe. But in, in the US, uh, many people who call themselves on the left, especially a lot of so-called independent leftists are really, they're liberals, or you could say they're kind of left identified libertarians. And basically they, they're against public health. They think that the idea of the state doing something on behalf of public health is inherently authoritarian. And it's, partially understandable because if you live in a bourgeois state like in the United States or even Canada to a lesser extent, you're so used to the state only being part of the repressive apparatus on behalf of the capitalist class, on behalf of billionaire oligarchs. So the idea that the state could do something good for people is completely novel and foreign to you. And I understand this as someone born and raised in the United States. I mean, it's almost impossible to imagine the US government doing something good. So in the rare example, when the US government decides to do half measures that were never in any way seriously implemented, claiming to care about public health. I mean, the idea that the US had lockdowns, that's, I mean, it was federalized. It depends on what state or city you were in. And in many states in the United States, there were never really lockdowns. And the idea of mandates and all these policies, it's a federalized system. In much of the United States, these policies were never implemented. And even in democratic strongholds with a capital D, they often were implemented in a completely ridiculous way, privatizing it, these policies to large corporations. And then of course, the US government had the worst of both worlds because it had these half measured policies and it refused to provide social support for people. So instead of looking at the horrible example of the United States' response to COVID where a million people have died, why aren't people who call themselves on the left looking at what actual left-wing governments have done in response to COVID? I think uh, first that comes to mind is, of course, China, which is constantly criticized. But I mean, China, which has 1.4 billion people, still has a few thousand COVID deaths compared to the US, which has one quarter of the Chinese population and has over a million COVID deaths. If the US population were the size of China's population, there would be more than 4 million COVID deaths in the United States. And not even just China, though. I mean, China is, is the clear example, but why, not, why aren't people studying Vietnam? Vietnam was very successful in dealing with COVID or Cuba. Cuba, which is a country under a brutal blockade, dealt with COVID very well. Cuba also developed six COVID vaccines. And this idea of this anti-vax sentiment is non-existent in Cuba. Why? Because people actually believe in their government. They understand that their government is a popular government that cares for the people, that implements policies of public health on behalf of people and not on behalf of corporations. So yeah, in that sense, I understand why there's this inherent skepticism of the US government or other capitalist bourgeois governments. Of course, normally I share that skepticism, but in the very rare cases in which a bourgeois government says that it's going to implement policies of public health, we have to analyze those from an actual perspective of seeing what those policies are. And again, in the US, there's a lot of criticisms and not just reject them outright because if the government does something, it's inherently bad. So that's one of the main reasons. Related to that is the libertarian current within, especially the North American left, especially the US left. So this is, I think, a result of, of political struggles that have gone on in the past several decades, where in, in many cases, people who call themselves socialist or part of socialist organizations, they often do find themselves on the same side of an issue as libertarians, as right-wing libertarians, right? So as an example, the opposition to the so-called war on terror, the opposition to the authoritarian measures of the George Bush administration, which have been continued by every subsequent administration and the Department of Homeland Security, ICE, CBP. This is of course a US case, but 
in many cases, people on the left and libertarians had that common ground. Also, in some cases, libertarians at least claim to oppose war. And that makes a, a temporary alliance of convenience between socialists and anti-imperialists and libertarians against war, against the war in Syria, the war in Libya, the war in Yemen. So because of that, that history of temporary alliances of convenience, I think a lot of people on the left have again, this vaguely defined left, especially people who are not part of a socialist organization or a party, have been ideologically really influenced strongly by the libertarian movement. And they even quite call themselves left libertarians or something. And they're basically fundamentally against the state doing something that violates this very narrow understanding of civil, liberty, civil liberties that is defined in a libertarian way that basically means I want to do whatever the hell I want without any consequences for other people. So the criticism that people, they because of this so-called COVID authoritarianism, they can't go into a, a business or whatever. They can. They can wear a mask. What they do is they choose not to wear a mask because their own narrow understanding of their personal liberty, which is this understanding that says, I want to do whatever I want without consequences for the public health and consequences for other people. They, they see that as the most important priority. That's not liberty because what it's actually, it's individualized tyranny with, without concern for any other people, without concern for the public good. This is not a defense of the, the capitalist you know, um, response to COVID, which obviously in the case of the United States, as I said, has been absolutely atrocious. But it is a defense of the socialist response against COVID, which has been extremely successful in China, in Vietnam, in Cuba, in Venezuela, and in other countries. And I think those models need to be studied very well. And then finally, the last thing I'll say here is I think the other main reason for this is because there's this idea that if the media, the bourgeois corporate media, says something that it's inherently wrong. And obviously, I mean, I'm a journalist, and I'm extremely critical of the media, and that's an understatement. I spent a lot of my time focusing on this, criticizing the media and its propaganda. And especially when it comes to imperialism and, and foreign policy, that's usually true. But in the case of public health, that's not, it's not always true. Even in the case of police brutality, in the past few years, the bourgeois media has actually become much better in its reporting on police brutality and racism. That's something good. Of course, that doesn't mean I support CNN. I mean, I constantly call it the CIA noise network. I mean, I'm against it deeply. But I mean, the, the idea that, that the media says something like public health is good, therefore that means public health is bad because the media said it. I mean, that's an infantile analysis. It's not a serious leftist analysis. So we need to look at the, the response of existing socialist governments and not even just like the, the central state. I mean, there's also examples like in Kerala, in Southern India, which has a leftist government in which the Communist Party of India Marxist is part of the government. And we can look at their example compared to other states in India that have right wing governments. And we can see that Kerala's response was much more effective. So when we, we talk about the left with these vague criticisms of the, the so-called left, why isn't Cuba and Venezuela and Vietnam and, and China, why aren't they considered part of the left? Because in, in many ways, actually, if you look at the international left, which represents the majority of the left in the global south, that is their response to COVID has been quite successful and much better than in the capitalist and imperialist countries. Thank you, Ben. I think you addressed yeah, multiple questions and kind of underlying issues that have been brought up during this uh, discussion so far. I appreciate that response. Um, so I uh, just want to let people know who I have on the list. We have uh, Brighton, uh, Radhika, then Brendan. Uh, then I also do have Alan and a question that's been posed in the chat. So we'll take uh, three of those uh, first, though. We'll do it. go ahead and start with Brighton. I have a two-step function on this microphone, so I wanted to make sure I was not interrupting anybody. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, there's, uh, there's a lot to unpack here on this panel, and I do have a lot to say. I will say um, the one thing that has really disappointed me within the past two years is seeing this uh, splintering of the left in regards to this situation. I say I think everyone on this panel is in agreement with me on this because we are up against the uh, common goal of, uh, you know, tackling capitalistic greed and, um, you know, to create a more compassionate collective society where we look out for our fellow man. 
And when I see people talking about how, um, you know, kind of making passive, uh, aggressive, indirect uh, insults to one another, then uh, refute with like a high school level insult, it, it just it doesn't further the cause at all. Um, I've seen both sides. I've listened to Ben, of course, we just heard what he said. I've listened to some other people on the left who are, um, you know, uh, echo his side, but I've also listened to other sides such as um, uh, Kim Iverson, Jimmy Dore, uh, The Convo Couch, uh, Nico House, just to name a few, who are uh, critical towards the uh, the policies of uh, the lockdowns, specifically within the United States and the Western world. Uh, and I feel that they do have sound points in what they are talking about. And I think they're worthy of discussion. But like I said, it's either like a straw man or some type of bickering. And the one thing that I'm seeing in regards to the response of uh, the Freedom Convoy, like I will say right now, as somebody who's on the left, I have been very um, sympathetic with the Freedom Convoy. I did see it as a working class uprising. I did. And I feel that their cause is uh, very sound. It's a direct action movement of the working class against any form of, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> a big pharma and its uh, stranglehold on uh, the capitalistic structure. And uh, with all these things, such as the, uh, the regulations, the vax passes, the lockdowns, it's all uh, like rooted within capitalistic greed. It is. And the thing is, like, we all, I, I've heard from the panel a few times from people saying, um, you know, there wasn't any talk about, like, you know, like, you know, getting higher wages, you know, improving conditions for the truckers. And I, I absolutely agree with that. But I, I'm, it, just because they're protesting doesn't mean we can also include that in the conversation later. Uh, I feel, though, it's just that we've seen almost absolutely no opposite opposition from the left in terms of policies in regards to the fact that if you came from Cuba and you were vaccinated with Cuba's vaccine, you cannot come through the Canadian border because they do not recognize it as a legitimate vaccine um, because the CDSA is bought by Big Pharma. They only recognize the mRNA vaccines because they uh, only boost profits while Cuba's uh, public sector, same thing with Russia's Sputnik vaccine, it's public sector. I've seen little to no uh, discussion from the left about this, and I think there deserves to be some form of protest because, as Ben just said there, um, Cuba's policies in regards to the COVID, uh, the COVID vaccine and the whole situation is because they were collective, they were sympathetic, and I think as to, uh, to quote... Uh, uh, I think it's uh, Yanis, you know, in Greece. I forget I forget the guy's full name, but, uh, you know, he's a socialist. He was having an interview with Brianna Joy Gray where he said, like, well, the main point is in how we get successful vaccination rates is because we, um, we, co we come to them with sympathy. We don't try to do these coercive mandates, which will scare people into uh you know thinking like oh they're trying to impose their uh their will upon me and so forth and so forth so they will go into the direction of not wanting to take the vaccine but like i said that's take it with sympathy like the last time i checked there was no vax passports within cuba or any of that nature in regards to like those mandates uh so and i i feel like that is lacking within the western world and what it's doing um in regards to COVID policies and i feel that there is something to be talked about in regards to the protests, the convoy, and especially when, you know, these direct action pro protests, uh, like we're not, we saw a junction from uh, the city of Calgary where they basically banned any form of protests in regards to the convoy for a brief time. Uh, then we also had Bill 100, uh, where uh, in Ontario that they have to like heavily regulate on what constitutes your protest and how you can protest. And I feel like if we like, you know, take away the people's right to protest, like we're losing our most fundamental freedom to make any form of change within this country or any place going forward. And when I hear people who are just saying like, oh, well, some of these people within the, the movement have, you know, views that I disagree with or they come from backgrounds that I don't like. It's just like, I, I feel like it minimizes the bigger picture because like I said, if they could come after one group of people, because like I said, they use the Emergencies Act towards 
mostly peaceful protesters who were not harming anybody. Yes, there was horns and everything, but like the Emergencies Act was structured in a way to combat actual terrorism, actual arson, and actual uprising within the streets. Um, and like, yes, there was an occupation, but like I said, I, I just thought with all the uh, what the media was trying to do and trying to smear the convoy was no different than Occupy Vancouver when I was part of that uh, way back in 20, uh, 2011, where they were trying to do right. everything. Yeah, sorry. Um, and I, I think that's under your points. Understood. Yeah. We'll have yeah. continuing discussion, but I think um, I think you've gotten your main point across here. Yeah, there was just a lot to unpack. I apologize if I went off. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Radhika, you are next, if you'd like to go now. Uh, great. Thanks. Uh, first of all, let me say it's been a fantastic panel. Thank you to all the speakers. I think the contributions were really great, and uh, I learned an enormous amount. Very quickly, I wanted to say that I think it was... Um, uh, uh, Cam Scott, but perhaps it was Gabriel, but one of you really, uh, I thought, did very good job of emphasizing the performative character of the truckers movement. That is to say, in a certain sense, it was about display. It was not necessarily about achieving a specific purpose. I really think that this is an important thing to understand. Um, and so I have a, a three quick questions. Number one, if the speakers could emphasize, uh, uh, whichever, any of the speakers, if you would please talk a little bit more about the relationship between the truckers convoy and what's going on in the conservative party and what we can expect to happen in the conservative party in the leadership election and going forward that would be very helpful because naturally we know that you know the truckers convoy was the context in which they got rid of the moderate Elino tool Pierre Polyev who is basically being anointed the leader of the conservative party by the sheer crowds that are coming to his talks is basically a, 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 pro, a, a sympathizer of the protest. So in this context, if you could say a little bit more about that. Secondly, I think that the whole international dimension that Jesus uh, and Ben and many others emphasized, I think very important. And if again, if you could elaborate, you know, one of the major concerns is that there is a, at the moment, you know, there's a whole issue of fa the fascist groups in Ukraine in the government, in the army, etc., And I think that um, the whole question of creating a sort of international brigade of support for these groups, I mean, this is really quite, uh, some even say that this is going to be done and is being done on the model of the Mujahideen where, you know, their ideology was Islamic. Now you'll get a bunch of white folks going to support neo-Nazis in Ukraine under the ideology of some sort of fascism, neo-Nazism, et cetera. So if you could please um, uh, uh, say something more about that, that would be very good. Um, finally, I'll just say one thing, like last, uh, the last panel here also, it's becoming very clear that one of the key issues uh, on, a, you know, that has fed into, at least into the sympathy for the convoy, is that there has been a very, the left has been extremely weak in voicing a reasoned opposition to government mismanagement of COVID without saying COVID is wrong, without uh, uh, without conceding or, you know, like while recognizing that COVID cannot be fought at an individual level, it has to be fought at a social level. The state has a big role to play in it. In fact, it has primary responsibility for it. And we have failed in this. And that's partly why the there is so much confusion around convoy. That's it. Thank you. Sorry to go on for a bit. Thank you, Radhika. Um, Radhika did pose three questions. Um, would anyone like to address those now? And then we'll go on to uh, Brendan and Alan. Cam, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy for anyone else to, um, but uh, where, where, where that goes, sorry, where, 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 Bright, where Brighton's points are concerned, I'll, I'll, I'll briefly say that I think that when you speak about some of the, the legitimate concerns that uh, traverse the convoy, broadly construed. To me, and we may simply disagree, that just points up the insufficiency of its rhetoric and its means and its emphases, um, you know, to the degree that there is there is a point somewhere in there that one can imagine being drawn out or articulated in, um, you know, an emancipatory 
a holistic uh, direction, but I, I, I just don't see it uh, happening really at any, at any level of this particular manifestation. I, I really do think that uh, the, the more difficult thing for me is, 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 is trying to figure out how this particular issue became a hot button topic for a right-wing movement that, that precedes the, the anti-mandate cause and precedes COVID-19. You know, I think about uh, the People's Party, which was a single issue anti-immigration party, basically, you know, very, very xenophobic that managed to quite successfully rebrand as a single issue anti-mandate party you know, and make some real political gains uh, in this most recent election. And the irony is really stark, you know, I think that they know what they're manipulating because I saw their signs everywhere during this last election. It was no to globalism on one hand. And then the other message was uh, stop vaccine passports. And I think about this language, passports. How is it that the People's Party that wanted to limit immigration is suddenly this single issue party talking about free movement and they're against vaccine passports. They would check everybody's actual passports at every door if they could, you know? So I thought that that was, uh, that was quite ironic. So I'm, I'm still more interested in figuring out how the, the, the mandate issue became a hot button topic for the right in which all of these other uh, pre-existing causes were condensed because those are the things that I think will uh, persist after this pandemic has somewhat abated. Now, to Radica's questions, I think it's really interesting. We should be attentive to this, the, the effect of the trucker convoy on, on the conservative party. You know, It's produced this very interesting split. You see Aaron O'Toole, who I, I suppose uh, was a more liberal, poll within the party and like a good bourgeois supported the mandates and so on. And, and you see this kind of petty bourgeois revolt within the party that I think indexes onto all kinds of uh, renaissance social conservatisms and so on. I'm not sure what this means for the future of the conservative party, if this fraction is going to actually weaken the political block of, of the far right and make them, you know, perhaps, uh, not so electable, or at least make it so that they'll not, they won't have a majority government in this form. I'm not sure. But you see a splinter within the party that's analogous to the splits within the right that you know produced the People's Party and so on. I think it's an opportunity for the left to capitalize on. This was Gerald Horn's um, analysis. And I'm, you know, and I'm wary of, of conflating these two unlike things. But, but January 6th in the United States, which was similarly a very hapless, self-styled, you know, coup that 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 didn't really get off the ground as such, and had this chaotic, seditious tenor and so on. It, it was it was uh, similarly a class collaborationist movement that. Uh, divided the right, you know, and Gerald Horn's counsel, uh, which I thought I, I thought might have some applicability here was to, uh, you know, not leap to the defense of bourgeois civil society as such, do you know, um, much like here, uh, I would I would say fuck Trudeau for my own reasons, but I don't have the bumper sticker because I understand that it's a euphemism. You know, rather than leap to the defense of bourgeois civil society, I think that we uh, can exploit this 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 division in the right, um, and and that that will be a, that will be a project moving forward. You know, to 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 use the the parliamentary division, uh, you know, in ways that even exceed electoralism as such. The international dimension. I really appreciate Jesus and Ben making it clear that um, this is part of a, a global uptake. Um, that for the professed isolationism of a lot of these white nationalist movements, you know, it's actually it's a it's it's a, it's a it's a global network, and, and and its organization transcends borders. I think that's very important to understand. Um, 
I think the other really crucial thing here I alluded to before is, is I, I think we should be very, very clear that this domestic proto-fascist movement is downstream of Canada's military adventurism abroad. If you look at the participation of people from Joint Task Force Two and so on, if you look at the participation of ex-servicemen, uh, reservists, uh, RCMP, law enforcement on the ground. Uh, to a large degree, this is people bringing the war, uh, the war home, as it were, and that that's that's really important. Um, as far as a left response uh, to the the insufficiency of the government's pandemic uh, measures, I think. Um, I hope that that you know the Communist Party and some other people uh, that I, I work with have been articulating some kind of alternative vision and making some alternative demands. I really, I really think that uh, a people's recovery. We like to speak of a pe people's recovery begins uh, with with really far-reaching economic justice and some of the things that the convoy didn't manage to treat. I think that that's the trick is it isn't only that they didn't manage to thematize everything, but that, you know, people are so determined to see it as this working class movement. All of the working class, uh, you know, all of the working class demands upon the government in a financial crisis, in an economic downturn, during an enormous transfer of wealth upward, you know, these are, are all meaningful in a pandemic as well. And uh, yeah, but I'll stop because there are other people I'd love to hear speak. Thanks, Cam. Um, would ben or Jesus, would you like to address uh, also especially the international question that Radhika had? Jesus, do you want to go ahead? Can't tell if Jesus is trying to speak. I think you better go then, or we can go on to the next question too, if you'd like. Okay, yeah, one second. Just turning my, my camera back on. Um, yeah, one second. It's now, now out of focus. <laughs> there we go. Okay, uh, so I think, you know, the, some of the questions were answered pretty well. There were, there were a few things I wanted to respond to, comments that were made um, by Brighton, I believe, about big pharma and vaccines. And I'll say, I, I, was, I live in Nicaragua. I was in Nicaragua throughout COVID and I saw the response. And what's interesting is that Nicaragua's, the, the Sandinista government's response to COVID was distorted and appropriated by figures trying to defend anti-COVID, uh, excuse me, trying to defend COVID denialist policies against public health measures. And there was this narrative, which is completely wrong, that Nicaragua didn't have, you know, these massive public health measures because Nicaragua never had a full-on lockdown. It is true that Nicaragua never had a full-on lockdown, and that is because over 70% of the population works in the informal sector, and the government made the decision that they could not simply tell everyone to stay home because a majority of the population works in the informal sector, and they, that's simply not an option for them. And we saw a similar COVID response in Mexico, which has a center-left government of, led, of the Morena Party. And in some parts of the Global South, there were similar measures trying to balance public health with the understanding that you can't just have a full-on lockdown because so many people work in the informal sector. At the same time, the Sandinista government had very strong public health measures at every level, including a max vaccination campaign. And now Nicaragua has the second highest level of vaccination in Central America, and that number continues to increase at all levels, including children and pregnant women. And also the, the Nicaraguan government created a, a white paper, a kind of uh, report or not a report, a kind of, um, uh, you know, a manual talking about ways to deal with COVID and, and public health measures and created teams inspired by the Cuban health model created teams of doctors and medical professionals that with full protective equipment went to rural areas and went to areas that were harder to reach to provide vaccination and public health knowledge. And also in Nicaragua, even though there was not a full, full on lockdown, at every single 
stage of the pandemic, including right now, today, there still is a mask mandate in, 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 inside buildings. So if I go to the grocery store, if I go to a government building, if I go to a store, there is a mask mandate 100% in all indoor spaces in Nicaragua still right now. And from the very beginning, that was true. This is the response of a government that clearly cares for its people and was quite effective. And that was the response also in Venezuela. It wasn't, wasn't exactly the same. In Cuba, the progressive and socialist governments in the region also dealt with COVID infinitely better than the right-wing governments in the region, especially looking at the horror show, the slaughterhouse that was Brazil under Jair Bolsonaro, who took the right-wing libertarian approach of not mandating masks, not mandating any public health measures, and not encouraging vaccination. On the contrary, Jair Bolsonaro was speaking out against vaccination. And as a result, Brazil has one of the highest death rates per, per capita in the entire world, up there with the United States. So for me, I mean, it's very clear I mean, hopefully if Jesus can speak to the case in Venezuela, I mean, it was a very successful model there. It was a successful model here in Nicaragua. And these are progressive governments that care for their people. Finally, the other point I wanted to make is the discussion of big pharma and vaccination. Now, the, the critique that Brighton made, which is true of these imperialist countries not allowing people to visit if they have a non-Western vaccine, is a critique that has been made very vociferously by the left in the global South. And we've seen this again and again in Latin America in particular, Cuba of course has vociferously criticized the refusal of these Western dominated international organizations, the refusal to allow, to allow the Cuban vaccines to be used, even though they are being used in some parts of the world. Here in Nicaragua, for instance, the Cuban vaccine is very popular. Well, some of the Cuban vaccines, because there are six, specifically the Soberana uh, is very popular and the Abdallah is very popular. And it's used also to vaccinate children, people between ages two and 18. So we, the, in Latin America, the perspective is very different. And I'm sure it's true in, Latin, in other parts of the global South, but with my understanding here in Latin America, the only protests I saw against COVID measures and vaccines in, in Nicaragua were led by the right wing who worship the United States. They think the US is the greatest country ever created. They all wanna to go to the US, they love the US. And they held protests against the Russian and Chinese and Cuban vaccines demanding they wanted the big pharma vaccines. And they refused to take the Russian and Chinese and Cuban vaccines. So we need to understand that these critiques that people are levying against this idea of like the left in the US which is never defined. And when they say the left, they mean like uh, some YouTubers they don't actually mean existing socialist parties and look at what their policies were in COVID. They talk about YouTubers. Like I say this as a journalist who has videos on YouTube, right? Like journalists don't represent what the left is. The left is a political movement that, that consists of parties and organizations and grassroots movements, not a bunch of individual media influencers who have YouTube videos. Like we shouldn't take the position on COVID from these people. We should take the position on COVID from existing socialist parties and movements and governments. So I, I just wanted to make all of those points because it, it's, it's, if you look at it outside of this narrow perspective in the United States and Canada and some parts of Western Europe and much of the rest of the world, the response to COVID by the left was a robust call for public health measures and it was very successful. Thank you, Ben. Um, Jesus? The moment of internet happened, so he wasn't actually there when we were calling for him earlier. But uh, Jesus, if you'd like to address a few of the points that we've been raised, yes, and then I we'll go few, on to our question. See. Thank you. Yes, I will add a few see a few things. Uh, Sorry, maybe try and move the microphone a bit closer. You were a bit louder okay. earlier. Do you, you hear me better now? Yes. Thank you. Okay. This internet is driving me crazy. But anyway, I, I just want to follow uh, uh, Ben's line of thought in terms of how uh, we in the South has been addressing the, the, the COVID issue. But before that, I believe that the, there is an existential uh, divide between, I mean, among us, among, I mean, within humanity in relation to COVID that is part of the problem. 
you know, is that uh, what, 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 what Steve mentioned, that, that individualistic approach to, I don't, I want to do whatever I want because I have my rights, not understanding that your rights are interconnected with the rights of others. And if your rights affect the rights of others, you are in clear uh, collusion with a, a collective approach. So, so, so I believe that that's very important because uh, within the left, you see that kind of people that insist in uh, not wearing masks, uh, opposing mandates, uh, criticizing Big Pharma that most of us in the left criticized, uh, but, but that's one scene and the other scene is thinking, I mean, I believe that the problem is that maybe we think that we, all of us have the same line of thought in relation to how to uh, solve the COVID issue. So that's part of the problem. I mean, and, and I believe that it's an existential one. We won't address, we, we won't solve that problem here because I believe that's embedded in people's head. Uh, and it's very complicated to deal with that. But, you know, taking the side of most of leftist people that believe in science, that criticize big pharma and criticize authoritarianism, but at the same time, we believe that something is need to be done as a collective, not as an individual to solve the COVID issue, uh, we will be in the same pace. So in that sense, uh, what I, I want to mention about what we did in Venezuela is that, I mean, we didn't have mandates. I mean, the word mandates did not exist in Venezuelan's approach towards COVID, for example. I mean, everything from vaccination, from uh, wearing masks in Venezuela was voluntarily. I mean, no one put mandates on wearing masks. I mean, uh, there was this recommendation from the government, but there was no, uh, there was not an obligation uh, to wear masks or to go to vaccinate. Of course, at some point, in some places, they were requesting uh, people's vaccin vaccination proof, you know, like passports to enter some places, but, but uh, actually even that right now is forgotten, if you ask me. Uh, because, I mean, also in Venezuela, uh, we manage the pandemic, if you ask me, in a, in a wonderful way. I mean, the government manages the pandemic, and we have one of the best numbers in the entire Western Hemisphere in terms of uh, COVID deaths, for example, you know, uh, in, in COVID, COVID cases. So, so, so I mean, even in the middle of the terrible conditions that US and European sanctions uh, put on the whole Venezuelan population. So, so I just wanted to add that and, and going back to Radica, uh, Radica's questions about how the, 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 the internationalization of the, of, the, of, the, of the convoy might you know, connect more. I mean, how can we, I elaborate a little bit more in, in that you know, internationalization of, of, the, of the freedom convoy. I really, I mean, the Guarimbas, for example, in Venezuela were organized by right-wingers, opposition people that wanted to oust first Hugo Chavez and now President Maduro. And, 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 and they have this uh, hatred towards the left that drive, drove them towards inflict arm against themselves, against their own people, yes, in order to create this sense of chaos that they saw was going to push Chavez and, and now Maduro out of office. Uh, I believe that there was something, the seed of that was in the Canadian Freedom Convoy. And, 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 and uh, of course, they didn't reach the level of violence that, that, that we reach here in Venezuela, but no one says that that could not happen. So that's why we have to address those, these issues properly because 
we as the, the, the global left, we need to uh, prevent those things. And maybe we need more leadership from the, from the, from the left in Canada and, and in the global north in order to, to, to organize something different, similar, but different uh, uh, to you know, move people's sentiments of frustrations and, 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 and anxiety, I don't know how to say it, and, 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 and build something positive out of that instead of, from my perspective, the negativity of the freedom convoy. Uh, so, so, so that's what I say, and of course, I mean that can be replicated. In as been mentioned in Brazil, uh, uh, it might happen in uh, Latin American countries who have the terrible uh, experience of what happened to Allende in the seventies with the truckers. So, so I mean, uh, there, I mean, there, there, they are real international implications uh, 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 for the left if we don't address properly what happened with the freedom convoy. So that's what I just wanted to add. Thank you, Jesus. And um, yeah, that's what this discussion is for and, and the reason there will be another panel and continuing discussions about the freedom convoy exactly because of its significance. So I have uh, two people on the speakers list. One question in the chat I wanna read. Uh, the goal is to wrap up in about uh, 20 minutes. So just so people have an idea, um, but we'll go ahead and uh, Brendan, uh, if you could go and then, and then Alan. Hey, thank you to very much to the speakers and I'll try and keep this brief. Um, I'd hope that Gabe may be able to speak to this a little bit more, but I'd really love to hear all the panelists views on um, the kind of American connection that he spoke to a little bit, both in the Q&A and in his speech. Um, I think in his presentation in particular, um, you know, while I hear that the American connection is important, it seems to me there was maybe a bit of an overstatement of the degree to which the Canadian far-right movements can kind of be seen or shorthanded as like an outgrowth of American influence, when I think that the roots of Canada's far-right are very much in its settler colonial character. Um, international in some sense, but domestic in, in other important senses. And I think that like, while we can look at January 6th, certainly, I think that we should be looking more at the United We Roll convoys at the, you know, the creation of the People's Party of Canada, which are again, like part of Canada's domestic political scene. Um, and I think that to the point that, you know, of course, the American far right has influence over the Canadian far right, but I think that the relationship is a lot more reciprocal than is often appreciated. Um, I think it was Ben Norton who spoke about Gavin McInnes, who is a Canadian, um, who has had a huge influence on the American far right. To that, we could also add internet personalities, Stephen Crowder and Lauren Southern, um, who in many, you know, so in some ways, there are kind of Canadian cultural exports that have a huge impact on the American far right. And it seems to me we're looking much more at sort of um, an ecosystem of far right movements uh, that exists across a colonial border. And I suppose what worries me about emphasizing and overemphasizing this American connection is that it kind of puts us in a strange position, um, uh, reminiscent of Canadian left nationalism, which defending the, the independence of Canada as a path to socialism is not a new idea in Canadian politics. Um, and I don't really see it as one that we should return to, if for no other reason that it kind of puts us in a strange position uh, on the left of during a time of indigenous resurgence where we're kind of defending a colonial border, which, you know, I think we can, maybe there are ways we can reconcile that. It's not totally clear how, how we can um, be nationalists in Canada in a progressive and anti-colonial way. So I'd love to hear um, everyone's thoughts on that, both um, Cam as a representative, not a representative, but as a member of the Communist Party of Canada and from our international comrades. So thanks very much to all the speakers and all the, all the discussants. Thank you, Brendan, and thanks again for helping set up this panel and the other panels. Um, Alan, go ahead. I'm actually going to ask a new question, which is I want to ask the part, I mean, a completely new question, which is what do the participants think of what's happened in France? Now, there's a very specific reason for this. I posted in the chat, you'll see. There is now an electoral alliance of the four left-wing parties of France, led by France, 
Ansu Mies, which includes the, the Greens, the Socialists and the Communists. I think this is the first time there's been such an electoral poll. It stands poised to win a majority in the legislature. The uh, Ansu Mies came within a hair's breadth of being the party that would actually have stood against Macron in the second round of the elections. They were, if anybody followed the polls, they just let up and up and up chasing Le Pen. Le Pen and France Insoumise have two things in common. They're opposed to NATO. So you actually have in France an anti-NATO majority and a very strong, it's the place in, in Europe where for a long time fascism has actually been strongest. And I have no hesitation in characterizing Le Pen's party as fascist, even with all the lipstick that's been placed on that particular pig in the last 10 years, especially by Western journalists, right? Now, what's at stake here? When people speak of the fact that the left has not combated all the things that the convoy latched onto. I think they make a fundamental mistake of uh, analytical terminology. No, it's liberalism which has failed. Many speakers have said this. The left has not failed to combat COVID. The left has failed to become a mass force. That's the problem. That's what it's failed to do. And to blame the left for what the NDP, which I do not consider a party of the left, it is a pro-imperialist social democratic party. It's not a party of the left. I certainly don't consider the American Democrats or the Canadian liberals to be parties of that. They're liberal, they're classic Weimar liberal parties. And they open the door to fascism, as has been said. They open the gates. The, the convoy people were, were knocking at an open door when they drove up, right? So the blame is not on the left. And if you call it the left, you are slandering the left. I'm sorry to use such strong words, but it's the classic thing that the far right does. It's to get a label which they can stick on the, uh, the people they want to fight which, which calls them communists or pro-Russia or Moscow stooges or whatever. No, the problem with the left is that it's not big enough. Now, that means there's a huge task in front of us. But I think the French, and I'm not noted as a, as a defender of the French political elite, but I, all the French left, I've had my spats with them, as people who know me will know. But I think on this, they've got it right. They've actually, they have actually voiced the concerns that used to be Le Pen's territory, and they could, if they follow, chase Le Pen out of politics. I believe that's really possible. And the tactics they adopted were very interesting. What they said is they, they stood on their platform. We oppose, you know, uh, NATOism, everything that Mélenchon was doing, bash, bashing working class rights and all the rest of it. They also stuck to their guns on NATO which none, none of the other left of the Europe, European left has done. They stuck to their guns because you can't be anti-capitalist unless you're anti-imperialist. It's not possible anymore. The space for pretending to be anti-capitalist as a social democratic liberalist has gone with the, with the decline of, 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 uh, of all the northern powers, which I've spoken about in the past. So they did that. So they got a mass base by doing that. So that shows you can. But then they didn't back down and they didn't support the fascists. So in the, in the third round, their point was that their position I think, was absolutely correct. And I'd like, you know, we should have a discussion. They said, pas un vote pour uh, Le Pen. No vote for Le Pen, but you choose. And they had a, an internal poll and some people wanted to vote for Le Pen, some of them to abstain, some of them to, you know, uh, they were all they allowed their mass base to discuss. And that's what we've got to do, because what the left, in my opinion, has lost the ability to do is the ability to disagree. What we're trying to do in the IMG is actually recreate the tradition the left used to have of having out its disagreements in such a way that its supporters are allowed to take part in that discussion so that the left is owned by the people. I don't mean the people in the populist sense, but, you know, in the sense of popular and working class. And, and that's what's <laughs> missing. So I, I just appeal on the one hand for people to actually examine the French experience. I think we should have a webinar on it. It's extremely interesting. Um, 
But I think that you also have to discuss the tactics for dealing with fascism, because we're in a very difficult stage, because not because of the failures of the left, but because of the absence of a mass left. Some of the ground that we wish to fight on, including even opposition to war, if you look at Orban and so on, have been taken, the space has been taken up by the fascists. And you need tactics to deal with that. It's, it's not sufficient. I'm not saying anybody here is doing that. It's not sufficient just to bash them. You need tactics. You, you need to win them away from their positions. Uh, and this is an issue of mass politics, not elite politics. So you have to think of very clear, simple, evident, self-evident ways of doing that that leads people to say, oh, right, OK, this is wrong. That's right. Um, I could go into what that might be in relation to all the issues they raise, but we're Thank at the you. end of a wonderful session. So I'm going to stop now. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. So we have kind of two questions now in front of the panelists. One is around uh, Canadian nationalism or nationalism in imperialist countries and what that means for working class politics, uh, specifically um, around maybe the growth of, of right wing um, movements. And then where Alan has ended as well, some reflections on what's happening in France uh, in regards to this as well. Who would like to start off some answers? Jesus, Ben, or Cam? Cam, you've been the first traditionally. You wanna go again? Um, I, I, I don't mind it, I don't mind it. Um, I would say, so to Brendan's great question, uh, this is something that I think is is important to theorize. I mean, I'm you know I'm, I'm actually going to go right. I'll go right back to the the start of your question, which is that I think it's worth scrutinizing. Um, I don't know what the flows of of capital that you know across across the border that that uh, you know I think it's worth pursuing these links and. Uh, and analyzing the connections between uh, the far right in the United States and the far right in Canada, just as I think it's worth analyzing the connections between the European far right and uh, some of the um, some of the movements that coalesced around January sixth, for example. And I don't want to make that out to be. Um, the most significant event actually in the development of the far right in the United States either. But I think that it is worth looking at where that funding comes from. But my skepticism is that I don't think we want to understate how strongly rooted uh, the convoy is in the Canadian right and how strongly rooted the uh, the Canadian right is in some of the constitutive structures of uh, the colonial project and the capitalist project as it developed in Canada. You know, I think that um, to speak of the total insufficiency of the NDP on almost every front, um, the strongest response that it mustered early on was to denounce this foreign backed far right movement, you know, and they were very interested in this idea that it was, it was US backed, but uh, they didn't have a lot to say about uh, the Canadian far right. So I think we should also pay very close attention to the support that the, the convoy received here uh, at the same time, as we've discussed. This is, this is no doubt um, uh, an, int an internationally networked movement. I think that where the specifically colonial blueprint for this, this kind of class collaborationist petty bourgeois movement is concerned. I think you can find its roots really at the, at the inception of the, the Canadian project. I think that like white nationalism, as, as you can find it articulated within the ranks of the convoy, I think that a lot of its operators uh, really, really, really 
are produced by by the sort of uh, tacit class collaborationism of settler colonialism. And uh, I, I think that the uh, repression of indigenous uh, occupancy and of the multinational situation here in Canada is pretty clear even from some of the theatrics of, of, of the convoy. You know, um, I think that the idea of, uh, you know, you have this revolt of, of the petty bourgeoisie, this downwardly mobile faction that has some self-earned capital and so on. You know, if you look at the very persuasive connections of the organizers to Western secessionism and all of this, um, all of this stuff. It's it's very clearly based also in in uh, uh, you know a, a, a colonial imaginary. You know this 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 kind of self earned solitary tenure on the on the frontier. You know this this is um, this is really a very suggestive sort of. Uh, this is the this is the mythology of white nationalists in Canada, who again, are are uh, they want striving backwards in time for this period of, of of social cohesion and relative homogeneity and so on. This this was a um, only procured by uh, colonial colonial means, and I think that this really motivates uh, the specific articulations and alliances of, 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 of the white nationalists in the freedom convoy. So it's, 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 it's absolutely homegrown. There's a lot to say on that, but, uh, perhaps I'll stop there because I, you know, I'm not here as a representative of, of, of the communist party, but we, you know, we definitely understand Canada to be, um, an imperialist country and we understand Canada to be um, a colonizing power. And we understand that, you know, Canadian finance capital today is pretty well integrated into US uh, transnationals and, uh, you know, an international uh, system of finance capital. So at the same time as I think that it's good to envision the, the relative benefits to the Canadian working class of, uh, you know, some kind of, I don't know what economic sovereignty of the bourgeois state. This is really, this is, this is really um, barely applicable to the present situation, you know? I think that that's something to be mindful of um, with this high degree of, of integration. And then lastly, because I, I, I really do want to hear from other people as well. I think that the French example is really, really interesting. And I think it's something that people should study. And I absolutely agree, Alan. But uh, at, at the same time, perhaps I'm having a failure of imagination. But I think it's hard to draft <laughs> correspondences and um, direct lessons from that where this uh, parliamentary coalition, um, as, as I understand it, I, you know, what would that even look like in a country that that where 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 no there are no credible leftist parties with any parliamentary representation whatsoever? Um, it's 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 difficult to imagine such a bloc coalescing, and I think that this doesn't mean that the French situation isn't uh, something that we should all be paying very close attention to, because all of our fortunes are interconnected. But yeah, that's um. That's my only thought there, is that uh, there isn't even a credible social democratic alternative in Canada. The NDP are liberals, the liberals are liberals, the conservatives are liberals who are now splitting into, you know, um, sort of this strange little proto-fascist uh, fraction and liberals. Um, I, I have, I have um, a, a very, very low opinion of pretty much any, any group with a parliamentary uh, presence in Canada. Yeah, well, I'll, I guess I'll jump in just to conclude here really briefly uh, on the two questions about the far right in Canada and on France. In terms of the homegrown nature of the Canadian far right, of course, I agree. No one can dispute that there are particular reasons for 
Canada having its own domestic far right rooted in the history of settler colonialism, racism, white supremacy, imperialism, the, you know, continued imperialist policies of the Canadian state. I mean, I mentioned earlier Canada's leading role in the coup attempt against Venezuela as a stand in for the US and the Lima group. Now we can talk, I mentioned Canada also arming Saudi Arabia while it's committing this borderline genocidal war in Yemen. I didn't even mention the role of Canada in supporting far right forces in Ukraine and the influence of far right Ukrainian forces in Canadian politics, just as no one in their right mind would say that the Canadian right wing is a, is a product of the Ukrainian far right. Obviously, no one would say that. I think instead we can similarly say that, that of course, the Canadian far right is not a pro product of the US right wing, but they all dialectically reinforce each other. And Ukraine's an interesting example because unlike the US, it's a much smaller country. It's not the global hegemon, but we can see very clearly the role of far right Ukrainian forces in influencing the Canadian right and Canadian liberals. I mean, with Christy Freeland herself, and then of course, vice versa in the Canadian right wing influencing the Ukrainian far right with the Canadian military uh, training neo-Nazi groups in Ukraine. This is extremely well documented and it's been reported by the by numerous newspapers in Canada. Um, so similarly in the US, I mean, there's this dialectical relationship. And of course, no one should deny that there is a far right that's homegrown in Canada, but also at the same time, we shouldn't deny the very heavy influence of the US in helping to shape that, that far right in Canada and the very strong influence, as the speaker mentioned, of the Canadian right wing in the US right. I mean, again, we have to have a dialectical understanding of all these movements. And it shows that, as, as another comrade pointed out, that you know these some of these far right groups may criticize immigration and what they call globalism, which by the way means nothing. It's an attempt by the, the far right to try to, to try to appropriate anti-imperialist ideas, but without framing it in terms of contradiction, in terms of opposition to imperialism, because they're not opposed to imperialism. They support imperialism, but they just they redefine elements of imperialism that are they're opposed to as globalism. And they often use that as kind of interchangeable with the idea of neoliberal yep, globalization. Yep, yep. But but anyway, um, so in, in response to France, I think, you know, I'm not an expert on French politics by any stretch of the imagination, but I just have a few interesting um, observations about it. One, I think what Alan said is absolutely true. And it's very, um, it, it very much, I think, provides a political lesson for everyone. The French left of all of the Western European left is probably the left that has been the least pro-NATO. Now, of course, there are still forces that are relatively pro-NATO on the French left, but Mélenchon, of all of the, there was this wave of these, you could, you could say, I wouldn't necessarily call them uh, socialist, but you could say left of social democratic leaders. Um, you had Jeremy Corbyn, you had Mélenchon, uh, you also had Syriza in Greece, which obviously ended up being a disaster, but of that wave of the, the, the first, uh, I guess you could say like the first decade of the 2000s and that, that kind of decade and, and into this new, the, this new decade that we're in now, there was this wave of these left of social democratic uh, forces in Western Europe and they were pretty much all defeated, Podemos in Spain as well. Of all of them, the, the, the left-wing forces that were probably the most critical of NATO were in France and it looks like they've succeeded. So I think there's a pretty clear political lesson from that. Accommodating your political movement to NATO does not help your movement. It actually weakens your movement, as we saw in the case of Jeremy Corbyn's movement. I mean, Corbyn, of course, is, I mean, he's, he has a long history of opposing imperialism and war, but in his second presidential run, I mean, or prime minister run rather, excuse me, <laughs> um, in his second run, in the election, he accommodated the European Union. He, he softened his criticism of NATO and he was completely crushed. And he, in his first run, he actually did much better than all of the polling suggested that he would have done when he was running openly on supporting a left-wing Brexit, running against the European Union and criticizing NATO. So from that, from the case of Corbynism, in which accommodating to NATO and accommodating to the European Union hurt his political movement, I, and in, from the fact that Melon shown has continued his opposition to NATO and his Euroscepticism, I think we can only conclude that a left-wing force in, in Europe that opposes 
imperialism and neoliberalism as embodied by NATO and the EU is actually going to be more powerful and more effective. And I think that's something that we should celebrate. And the other observation I, I had about France is that in the case of the first round of the election, I think we should definitely engage in some self-criticism as the left because the Communist Party of France had endorsed Melanchon in the previous two elections. And he unfortunately was not able to, to win uh, one of the first two places in the first round of the election. But with the number of votes that the Communist Party of France had received in the first round of the election this year, if the Communist Party of France had endorsed Melanchon and if 75 to 60 to 70 percent of the people who voted for the PCF voted for Melanchon, he would have actually beaten Marine Le Pen in the first round. And the second round of the election would have been in between would have been between Macron, a banker and Melanchon, a leftist who opposes NATO and criticize the EU. So. I think that's another example of what happens when the left is not unified. Unfortunately, the reality is that the political system is monopolized by neoliberals or the far right, as was portrayed in the false choice between Macron and, and Le Pen. Great, thank you, Ben. Uh, Jesus, did you have anything uh, short that you wanted to add? And then I have one final question to ask to wrap yes. it up. Yes, yeah, something very small, because I believe that the question was more directed to the people in the global north. But uh, uh, I believe that the questions that the last question that you read was somehow con trying to connect this debate between, you know, uh, the nationalism, uh, patriotism within the left, and this ultra right nationalist movements somehow connected to the to the to the Can I, Canadian freedom convoy so uh, from my I mean uh, I believe that that debate that is a debate that is mostly very heated in the global north in the in the especially in the settler colonialists you know countries like Canada, the US and in European countries, uh, uh, I mean, uh, is important because uh, there, 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 there's, I mean, the debate is there and, and, and there's confusion among some people in the left uh, about being uh, nationalist or being internationalist. And, 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 and that's a long debate, uh, but we need to address that issue because there's people getting caught in the middle of the debate and not knowing exactly how to position themselves within uh, the, this theoretical uh, problem. So, so, so I just want, I just want to, to, recognize that the debate is there, that people should understand that if you are a Marxist or, or if you are a, a Marxist-Leninist, you should uh, uh, understand nationalism in a broader way and not in a chauvinistic way. Uh, but, uh, and, 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 and that chauvinism is basically what uh, characterizes the, the, that movement uh, connected to Trump, to the Freedom Convoy, and to, you know, all this new uh, populist right phenomena. And, 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 and we need to address those things to try to solve this, you know, uh, dilemmatic uh, discussions uh, among people in the left. So I just wanted to add that, sorry. Thank you. So I'm going to uh, say this short statement of thank you. Uh, which is uh, thank you to all of the panelists for participating here today, uh, to all the organizers uh, who brought this panel together. This is again the second of three panels, so keep your eyes and ears open for the next. Uh, there is a question in the chat. I'm gonna give everyone just 30 seconds to wrap up at the end because uh, some of the people do have another <laughs> webinar starting in five minutes. Uh, but uh, the question uh, that I think is important came from Morgan, and it's any advice or strategy for the panelists uh, be able to give uh, for principled activism, kind of what can people do? And I know 30 seconds is probably completely insufficient, but 
succession will continue and uh, we'll go ahead and do Cam, uh, Jesus, and then Ben to sign off for today and uh, look forward to talking to you all again soon. In 30 seconds, I mean, that's a, that's a huge question. I mean, I think that, I, 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 I think that uh, thinking uh, strategically and coalitionally is very important. I think that uh, pushing for the politicization of organized labor is very, is very important. You know, uh, Teamsters and the Canadian uh, truck, uh, Truckers Alliance or, uh, you know, the unions that are, are typically quite politically uh, moribund, there's a great deal of inertia there, uh, you know, did weigh in on on uh, the political valence of the convoy. And I think that um, particularly where the drive to war is concerned and connecting all of these issues, the politicization of organized labor is very important. And then the other thing I've been saying is that, uh, you know, the right is waging a culture war and they see venues for their project everywhere, everywhere in bedrooms, classrooms, and so on. So I think rather than abdicating this war of position, uh, in favor of uh, some kind of, I don't know what narrowly workerist kind of conception. I think that, um, uh, as I've said before, I would repeat that uh, a defensive against uh, a proto-fascist tide should, should also uh, include um, really some eff uh, offensive measures in these, in, the, in these different venues. I think that we need to... Uh, I think that we need to be in all the social movements because these are the bugbears of the convoy, you know. And I and I, and I think that uh, we should take them at, at face value: the galling, the transphobia, the queer phobia, the racism, all of these things. We need to support the social movements uh, that uh, that that advocate for the groups that the convoy uh, has 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 really selected for scrutiny and uh, Thank harassment. You. Thank you, Cam, again, Cam Scott. Uh, Jesus Espinosa, final words? Yes, I just want to say that uh, I believe that uh, I'm a Chavista, and I believe that Chavez saw uh, what Chavez uh, taught us in Venezuela is important in terms of, I mean, Chavez tried to listen to the people. I mean, he, he tried to connect deeply with the necessity and the frustrations of Venezuelan majority. And I believe that's key. Uh, of course, uh, we are talking here about a leader, but then he created this movement. And I believe that movements also have to exercise that uh, uh, necessarily, uh, I don't know how to say it, to listen uh, to the necessities of the people. Uh, uh, and uh, this means to pay attention in the case of Canada, to pay attention to the indigenous disaster that exists in Canada. I mean, the, the disaster of the, uh, against indigenous people, to pay attention to all those, uh, the environmental issues that are uh, affecting the indigenous communities there, the, 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 the paying attention to the to the to the claims and the demands of uh, those communities of the um, segregated communities by ra racism, for example, you know the black communities, brown communities that are affected by ra racism that we know exist in Canada also, and and uh, and also even this compass in the left that. And that in good heart believe that the freedom convoy was uh, something uh, necessarily. Even those uh, compass, uh, we might try to listen to them. I mean, because they might be. Uh, uh, I mean, they, they, we sympathize with their claims sometimes, especially those ones that are against big pharma. Those are those ones that are against authoritarianism. We, we need to bring them to our side, and you know, build you know this uh, movement that tries to. Uh, I mean, at least to try to neutralize uh, right wing tendencies. Thank you, That's Jesus. It. Sorry to get you out there. And then the final word. Yeah, just briefly, people asked on what I think people on the left should do. I mean, uh, just for what it's worth, as I mean, my opinion as a journalist, I'm not an organizer, but echoing what I had said earlier, I think something that I've been thinking about a lot is that in 
the so-called Western left, it is very atomized, not in the sense of just divisions, but also in the sense of this loose collection of individuals who claim that they're a leftist or a socialist or whatever. I mean, my advice would be get involved in a, in a socialist party or organization. I mean, because you can't have collective action as an individual, even if you support the idea of collective action. And I think Jody Dean argued this extremely well in her book, Crowds and Party, about how there's this fetishization of this idea of decentralization that has seeped into large parts of the global north left, this kind of anarchist libertarian left that has disavowed the most important instrument of the working class, which is a socialist party. And the reason that socialist governments have been able to, to continue to hold power despite the many obstacles in the case of you know, the blockade against Venezuela, the blockade against Cuba, the uh, constant meddling against China is because they have strong parties that continue moving the revolution forward. In the case of Venezuela, they have the United Socialist Party of Venezuela. Here in Nicaragua, the Sandinista Front continues being a strong force. In Cuba, you have the Communist Party of Cuba. Of course, in China, the Communist Party of China has continued moving forward. It has almost 100 million members. Until the, until the left can build large parties and organizations in the global north, it's not going to be able to take power. So you know we can criticize the left all we want, but we also need to, to build institutional power. All right, on that note, thank you to uh, all of our speakers again, uh, to the panel organizers and co-sponsors, and we will see you at the next one. Have a great day. Thanks, thanks. And Happy thank Mother's Day. Thank you to Alison for brilliant Bye -bye. sharing. Thank you very much. <laughs> great panel, everybody. Yeah. Bye -bye. Peace out. Wonderful. Thanks to all. Thanks to speakers, mm -hmm. question, questioners, etc. Bye, everyone. And thanks to all the participants. Yes. Thanks so much, so much everyone. Thank you. It, enjoy the sunshine if it's there. No sunshine mandates. Oh. <laughs> oh. I'll I'll quit before you can get back. <laughs> uh, well, me and Allison live in the same city, so it's like Mother Nature's bipolar. One day rains, one day it's sunny. So when the sun's out, you seize it. <laughs> yeah.